Hello and welcome to Naval History Live. And today we are going to be looking at Patron 36, Carl von Gasberg's repair ships from the age of sail through steam steel, the Camacho USS Vulcan AR5 to the future. Fun times it shall be. Hello, everyone. Let's see who we got chatting away. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Rick Vasava. Hello, Albert Dusky. Hello, Sam Thompson. Hello, Timmy Locker. Hello, Vision. Ooh, TF uh, NFL is on today. Hmm. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Glad you're here. Hello, Hieroglyph. There might not be much about USS Vulcan. I have to admit, I probably forgot that one part of that part of it when putting this together. But I've got a picture ready to add in. USS Idaho. Hello. In terms of hello, bitch. I'm talking about USS Idaho. Failed experiment. Mm. It was an idea. It's an idea. These things are all ideas. Hello, Knight 6831. Hello, Frank Spazato. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Hello, World War II submarine history of a haiku. Hello. Hello, Zachary Gherkin. Hello, Stafford Thompson. Hello, Sean V. Hello, Shumi. Hello, DG40. Hello, Dub Squad. Hello, Zachary Gherkin. Hello, Seneca Nero. <laughs> hello. Ooh, hello, George Newman. <laughs> Hello, Win and Price. <laughs> That's good. It's not the only. I'm not the only one seeing a weird mono and current picture in front of the camera, right? <laughs> Hello, Felix B. Hello, everyone. Now, <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that as a bit of a starter. Uh, how do I put it? I've been playing around with some of the systems tonight because I got. Rather like I did the sepia coloured one for doing the Civil War, because I thought it rather fitted it to do it slightly oldie wildy style. I am considering using that sort of sketchy look for one in the future. I'm, I'm quite interested to see if I could put the fluffy research assistant into it and how it would work. But that was the first time I tested it live. And, well, it seemed to work well. It's worked well in the recordings, but I want to check if it worked well in the live. Hello, everyone. Oh, yes. I have to say I'm having fun. I have... My radio mic has arrived for my phone to work with it and everything, which is all good. They sent a radio mic for me to go to... Because I'm going to Portsmouth tomorrow to do recording. <laughs> For all of you on M33. And um, I'll then be giving a little bit of a guided tour to some uh, to my friends who are kindly accompanying me and acting as my recording crew. So they're going to get a tour as their thank you. I'm not sure if that's a good thank you or a bad thank you, but it's what they've asked for, so it's what they're getting. To be fair, it is the friend who I'm man of honour for at her wedding, so I feel she sort of owes me. <laughs> hey, Deb Squad, how do you interview with the RNI on Sunday uh, tonight today? RNI today, cool. That's always good. I think it might look like an animal from Muppets. The only question, uh, only trouble I really have with this lovely system as it turned up is it's come up with the wrong jack in that. Okay. So. I know what's happened. They've sent me the full pack and I, I was sensible. I did order and I did order the right thing. And I know this isn't topic, but this is kind of on topic because we're talking about maintenance and repair ships and... You therefore you need to ring the right components with you to be able to do the repair. And that's why you have the maintenance ship. Well, this is supposed to be a 3.5 to Type-C jack. So it can plug in 
to the phone, because the phone is what I'm using for the recording. However, you might notice a small problem. Yes, they've sent me the wrong jack. So, at some point tomorrow morning, frantically, if, when I get down there, I am going to be searching through Portsmouth to try and find the right store that will stock a 3.5 mil, mil, mil to Type-C jack so I can actually use my radio mic. Fun times. Josh, hey, small quick question. What about, what about this week's Jabil Trumps? This week's bilge pumps and potentially next week's bilge pumps are going to be recorded on Saturday. Well, no, actually, no. They're probably going to be recorded on Sunday. And I we have to apologise for it, but we've just been... All three of us have been busy. Jamie's had a conference. Alex has had things. Drax had... I've had things. Drax had things. Uh, we've all had things to do. And it's just... At no point has it matched up that at least two of us have been free and available. At no point, sadly enough. And we've kept trying. And it's been sort of... We are considering doing a couple more episodes and then calling it for the Christmas holidays anyway. Well, what the summer holidays for Jamie, Christmas holidays for me and Drac, because we have to keep going and doing things at the moment over Christmas. Um... Uh, we're, you know, both me and Drac are driving the length and breadth of the UK, and it's fun times at the moment. But it will be get back, and it will be back up to normal standards soon, at some point. It's no problem. It's to an extent, it's my own fault. Um. I went for the fancy system, which is very, very cool and advanced, but was going to take about a week to arrive, rather than the cheaper system, which was slightly less advanced, which would have arrived within a day. And then if I'd had problems with that one, I could have sorted it out, whereas this one literally arrived today. It's on me. Anyway. Today, we are slightly going to Random Town in that I am I'm broadening the definition of repair ships apart from repair ships because there are a lot of ships which do repairs which aren't repair ships. There are store ships, depot ships, tender ships, repair ships. And by the way, depot ships and tender ships can be the same thing, but they can also be different things. So some ships can be depot ships but not be a tender, and some tender ships can be tenders, uh, can be tenders but not depots. <sighs> because some tender ships require uh, 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 require so much space for accommodation, they can't carry many stores, so they need a depot ship to support them, which means that they get a depot and a tender ship attached to a flotilla, but you do... And basically, it goes on like that. So, we're going to try and cover them all. But the point is, we're going to be looking at... Why you need repair ships, what are the sort of repair ships that are going around, what those repair ships are for, and why you, and what they have them. But basically, the answer that we're going to be circulating around the entire time is you have repair ships when you have lots of ships which can't carry enough stores themselves to repair themselves. Hieroglyph, Tuts and Chase, one on one, Shinano versus Unicorn. Matchup results. Um, if it's their air group, Shinano, and pro uh, Shinano probably wins. If it's their gunnery, never count out the armored carrier. Frank Sander, don't see, what is it like being out on sea on a ship for the first time and seeing the land disappear for a while? <laughs> Heaven. <laughs> That's the only way I can describe it. Oh. And even the, these days, you have an even better one. It's how far do I have to be out before I lose mobile phone signal? <laughs> oh. 
sadly a lot further than it used to be. You can't lose it in the channel anymore. Mm. Take care, Nautical Wolf. Nice hearing. I only know of Kamkatcha from, Dra uh, from Drak and IGN and Kashi in USS Vestral, unfortunately. That was from Azalein. Akashi is a cat gem gremlin and Vestral the mother hen to the CV6 Enterprise. Hmm. That wouldn't surprise me, Vestral. Take care, Stafford. Uh, stuff on, on a ship with no land, humbling the sight at the same time. Twenty-five foot sailboat on Georgian Bay. That it would be. I was on the first time I couldn't see land. I was on something a little bit bigger. Might well have been painted grey. And occasionally operated whirly birds from the stern. <laughs> That's good. The whole point is not to have signal. <laughs> oh, hello. I, I, I'm, I, I am. Um, I, 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 hello, fan. First time catching a stream. A stream. Thank you for coming. I am um, now trying to Google Translate your name. <laughs> I will admit that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Literally, Google Translate. <laughs> oh. hmm. Can you bro? Can you bro? I think. I think that holds Google Summit, Kashibara. I could be mangling it horrifically. In fact, I most likely am, but we'll leave that to one side. Where's the questions gone? Oh, they're down there. Why is it moved my mouth? So. <clears throat> Don't worry. There's no worry about the name. It's a, it's just I want to know what to call it. I, I, I hope Kashibar cantilever, cantilever. Okay. Well, then I will go with cantilever. Hello, Grace Sarsky. Gentlemen, did you see torpedo boats? I have seen tor seen a torpedo boat. Uh, French one. What is the Tur kind of equivalent to Beef Wellington? Tur uh, Tur Duncan equivalent to Beef Wellington. Uh. Not sure. Not sure. <laughs> oh. Let's take a If the USA never built a new repair ship, should they be named as the Vessel of Class? That'd be quite cool. Hi, Phil Williams. Hi, G.D. Hannum. And hello, everyone. Right. So. <laughs> right. So, the Age of Sail. This was one of the first things which came up, and it was kind of interesting, because there are store ships in the Age of Sail. There are ships which go out into the world with stores on them to go and resupply fleets. Uh, usually they carry food and spars, but, uh, food and sail spars and water, uh, but they can carry more. A sailcloth tends to turn them up quite a lot in their store inventories, but they're not for repairing the ships. They are store ships, but they're essential, but they are store ships. And the reason is because in the Age of Sail, 
you have two adva free, uh, two advantages. One, you have a large number of people who aren't going anywhere at, at, at that fast. Two, the pace of actions is actually slower. So if you see the enemy coming, you've probably got a couple of hours before you need to be at action stations. So you can stop what you're doing and change tasks. And three... You have quite a spacious hull because it needs to be quite spacious in order to carry the artillery, etc. You are mounting and deal with the energy of their fire. So you have space for some stores. You can still get tight. And then you need some experts. And well, here are the experts. So every ship becomes itself its own repair ship. And they're warrant officers. This is where we get the warrant officers from, in fact. Because it means these are officers appointed by a warrant rather than commissioned by the Crown. In many respects, warrant officers are the almost more professional in some respects than their naval officer counterparts, especially at the beginning of the Age of Sail. They have to have served apprenticeships. Uh, they didn't have to keep watches, and they received higher wages than sailors, including some junior officers. Mm, as on small ships, they often dined with the officers, and on some of the larger ships, they might have their own warrant officers' mess. The two car, uh, two people were mostly report dealing with in terms of repair, are the carpenter and the sailmaker, but. Also, you should never forget the Botswain slash Bosun, who would always be organizing painting parties and maintenance crews in that respect. And would also be quite a... And there's also the Purser, who is critical in terms of procuring supplies when you're in foreign ports. They're the person who has access to the gold on the ship and would go and make purchases in the name of the Crown. So you have a logistics system and supply system in terms of the bots, uh, bots Wayne, Boson, and Persa, and you have actual repair system in terms of the carpenter and the sailmaker. Carpenters have careers. They are civilian employees of the Navy board and dockyard, as well as officers in the Navy. And again, the thing is with warrants is their warrant is to the ship. They are appointed by the Navy board to the ship. And yes, the picture is of the Chatham Dockyard Navy Base. Is the Chatham uh, Chatham's um, Chatham's Mast Pond, and I'll get to that in a second. Now, whilst you could, in theory, do your apprenticeship afloat, as a rule, you didn't. As a rule, you did your apprenticeship in the sh in the yard. Shipwright is a term which comes out mm, comes in later, but. They get their qualifications into at the do in the dockyards. Then they go to sea on the ships. Then they come back and get further experience in dockyards. Then they go to sea as a carpenter, as a senior carpenter. So they'll go to sea as a carpenter's mate or the carpenter's crew. Then they'll come back, do more time in a dockyard. Go to sea as the carpenter, and then come back again into the dockyard, and they could go up becoming master shipwright. So this is part of the of the process the Royal Navy has going on with its construction of ships. So the people who go to who build the ships are the people who go to sea to maintain the ships. Are the people who then come back to, from sea and build the ships before going to sea and maintaining the ships before coming back and building the ships at a more senior level? And so you have this link going up the whole way through. And it's one of the advantages of the British system. Yes, other navies have sort of so suedo systems like this going, but they're interrupted, especially the French one, by the various actions of. The revolutions. And so the Royal Navy has this going through. It affects the way their ships are designed, and it also affects the way their ships are built. But it'll, of course, most importantly, it affects the way their ships are maintained at sea.
Now, one of the interesting questions I got from people when I was discussing this on occasion on Discord and before putting this out there was, oh, well, where do they store the spars and wood spars on the ship? Because on land, they have to put them in these special in these special ponds to keep them uh, to keep them damp, basically to stop them drying out, to stop the resin leaving them. They're put into what is an effect a lime bath. It's lime and water mixed. They 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 try and keep it at a sort of a, a certain percentage level, not quite ph level ideas but ph level does come in later on as the years go on but to start off with they're keeping it quite together but at sea well the trouble is you try and keep the bilges dry so it's not going to be stored down there and if we go to this lovely drawing of hms victory by john larson which of course doesn't really show it, you'll see actually there's the bilge pump which is trying to pump stuff out and is one of the crew uh, jobs which people really don't like getting obviously but where are you going to store spars where are you going to store long pieces of wood well you tend to store them up on the top deck this both makes them easier to access for if you need to do a running repair it tends to keep them quite damp relatively speaking and you can always pour some seawater over them if you need to and most importantly, it's easier to replace them and to keep track on the store. Because one of the critical jobs of the carpenter on board is to go and check the wood stocks every day. They'll have a large amount of lumber, which is roughly hewn planks. They haven't been shaped. They haven't been smoothed down or anything like that. So... It's entirely up to the carpenter's crew aboard the ship to shape them. And on the bigger the ship, the more likely they are to have a dedicated crew. On a smaller ship, it'll be sailors who are assigned by the botson usually, uh, to go and assist the carpenter. But they'll all be involved in the maintenance. One of the most interesting jobs you could think about but also sometimes a uh, good path for boy sailors especially the, the, the boys who go to sea very young to be powder monkeys that's to run around with the powder literally in, in a battle and make sure the powder supplied to the guns well there are two good careers you can go for if you're a start off your life as a powder monkey you can aim for being a fore topman. That's the person, the sailor, the sailors who get the most money because they're the ones who go right up to the top of the sails. You can aim to be a carpenter, a gunner, or a sailmaker. Now, the sailmaker. They're more likely to start training young boys on ships quite happily because anything which means they don't have to crawl around the sails as much themselves down in the holds. And they can send the powder monkey down to do that. They'll be quite happy to do that. So that's the uh, one you can start training for youngest to get yourself out of being a powder monkey, becoming a sailmaker. And that's a protected and very, very value, uh, very value pr profession. And again, it's more money. Hello, Frederico. Kenneth Johnson. That picture, Doctor. Channel Naval Base. Yes, that was Channel Naval Base. I think I answered them. Frederico. Also, what are their duties in battle? Well, this is one of the interesting things. Um, Theoretically, they're damage control parties. However, quite a lot of carpenters uh, manage to earn very much earn honours, especially on smaller ships, for leading boarding parties.
uh, because they tended to be quite good at swinging big axes. And they would carry some of the biggest axes. Carl the Killer Gunner. It's one of the things you want moisture in. Yes. Because you want your spa to be as subtle, subtle as possible for shaping it. Nice thing. The supply class fast combat support ship would make a good repair ship the whole time. Mm, potentially. Hi, sure, Mac. How often would the ship's most unpopular job be done? Well, the most unpopular job of the ship was actually manning the bilge pumps, which had to be done daily, uh, sometimes twice or even three times daily by 30 men. So that was not a fun thing to do. Uh, <laughs> the next most unpopular one is, of course, as I said, was checking the stores and checking your sales. And that, again, had to be done daily. You had to check that no nothing has got into the sales and is trying to eat the sail cloth. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, didn't the class before the supply class have the Iowa battleship engines in them? I think there were some which had not the full Iowa engine suite, but had the same turbine boiler setup as you got in the Iowas. Sure, Mark, so learn artisanal skill, don't be a manual laborer. Pretty much. Because why just repair your ship when you can get paid to repair both? Well, this is the other thing. If you think about it, when you take a prize, often both ships are damaged. So a carpenter can get pay, it can earn a lot of money repairing the ship. And let's put it this way. If you're a carpenter's mate, i.e. Uh, second most senior, and you go back as part of a prize crew in a newly taken ship, Guess what often happens when you get home? Yeah. You get your warrant to make carpenter for that ship. That's incentive. For anyone in the carpenter's crew, you want to go home as acting carpenter on the prize. Because that can get you straight to your warrant. Seneca, what is a spa? A spa is the... Well, it's basically, it's the important part of the mast, because you have the mast trunk, and then you have the spars, which are the sails come off. And, and prizes often had to be repaired. Oh, yes, they did. Very saucy. I would imagine clearing, cleaning the heads was not the most popular task. Um, Greg, I want you to have a look at this ship. Um, I want to ask you where you think the heads are. There is a deck on there called the poop deck. And that might be where you stick something over the over the sea. But um try and look for something called the heads. And this is of course HMS Temera, which is another good one to show. And really it illustrates better than the previous one uh the whole storage space underwater underneath in the, all the amount of stuff that's stored down there. It was pretty crucial, all these things. Their ship had to be able to keep going and maintain itself. The whole point was, in the Age of Sail, you didn't have the bases that you later on have. You didn't have the facilities that you later on have, and we take for granted. The center character, the head is a head at the bow. Mm.
It's like, okay. Oh, I know. They're at the bow. Yes. <laughs> sure, just had a thought about my cat. His tendency to stretch at a function. Were there any ship's cats that were noted for ripping things up like sails? And if so, what was done about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, the main thing, problem with the sails was occasionally the rats tried to eat them, which is why the ship's cats were light. So... It's a case of you, uh, the carpenter and the sailmaker would often be very good friends with a ship's cat. Very, very good friends with a ship's cat. Uh, and there would often be a couple of ship's, ca uh, ship's cats. In fact, it was rare there was just one. Were any auxiliary operations done at sea? In the age of sail, yes. You would get food and water transferred at sea. It would tend to be rowboat transfer, but again, things go at a different pace of time. Or occasionally, occasionally, you would, using, how do I put this? Using police tackles and a, probably a spare spar or two, Rig up something which looked approximately like an A-frame crane near uh, using one of the masts as its main support and lift some stuff up. Now, there is another job the carpenter had on board ship, and another reason they carried quite so much lumber. Because you are all probably thinking about, after a battle, repairing the size of the ship. Now, that would be quite hard work, but they would do that. No, no, no. The thing that would often take the most time, and the thing that could make a carpenter's name, is repairing the gun carriages. Yes. These things, they break, they get hit by enemy cannonballs, they get hit by their own cannonballs, they go to splinters when it fires for some reason, someone hasn't been maintaining it properly and it decides to just go when you fire. I forget which exact battle it was, but the Admiral actually reported back that a third of the gun carriages on the ships of the fleet were needing to be replaced. Now, as time went on, they got better. They basically over-engineered them, they used more iron, lots of things got added in. But, it was for this reason that there was actually occasionally a second fire aboard ship. Because as we often talked about, when we're talking about wooden ships, the only fire aboard is the galley fire. It's for operating and for, you know, cooking them food. So that's the only fire you can safely have, even though if you have a very big stove, that's supposed to sort of warm the ship. Otherwise, you basically depend on whatever clothes you can get. Well, there's someone else who occasionally has to have a fire on ship. And occasionally you can use the stove for it, but... Honestly, that might not provide enough heat. It might not be big enough. That's the carpenter who has to shape wood. It's fun. Next on, did other non-UK nations do this kind of thing and stuff too? Yes, they did. To a lesser or greater extent. That's what I was Ask the guys from Balnar how many shut up prizes they had. Promotions for all the carpenters, mates. For all the ones that survive, and all the carpenter crew who had to take over for mates because they were the senior crewmen. 
Mm -hmm. Sure, right. no matter how well engineered uh, to be idiot proof, nature will find an idiot dumb enough to figure out a way. Uh, possibly. Uh, there's an interesting discussion going on about lifeboats in the chat. I'm sort of watching it. Uh, for example, Doxy, was any of this pioneered by the French, Dutch, Spanish? Yes, some of these, uh, some of them. How do I put this? Some of the design and some of the structures were put forward by the Dutch and the French and the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish, especially early on, had a lead. But it seems to be. How do I put this? One of the defining features about the Royal Navy that comes into its own is the way the Admiralty is structured. And whilst other navies do in have their own versions or even copy the Royal Navy, the Admiralty Board and those things are kind of special. And they are kind of vital. The level of bureaucracy, the level of layers into this all has an impact. There is also the fact that whilst they are warrant officers, and this is despite what you get written in some very, the, the far more stratified Victorian era about them, they are often considered quite respectable. Quite good careers. They're a way for a man to rise. Um, so... It's sort of different, but also there is the fact that the other navies have these have some of these similar things going on. The difference is the amount of money and the consistency and time the Royal Navy manages to put into it. You always have to remember, for France, the navy is an advantage, a useful thing, but it isn't the it isn't their life. The Royal Navy is often viewed as the British life. Without it, we aren't. We don't survive. So that gets a whole different level of investment and support beyond which other na nations don't tend to necessarily match. Yes, I have USS Celtic up here. Now, she is technically called AF2. And she's technically a store ship for the Spanish-American War. However, during the Spanish-American War, she pretty much does everything, including... some of the maintenance work and some of the refit works. And after the Spanish-American War, she is... Well, she's one of the ships which end up in Sicily. And she sets up a tent city of Messina. She serves all the way through World War One, And is not decommissioned till 1922. So, she is commissioned as a supply ship for the Spanish-American Civil War in 1898, after having been built at Belfast in Northern Ireland in 1891 by Workman Clark and Company. And that's Clark without the E on the end, so no relations, I presume. Occasionally we drop the E, but very rarely in my family once they get past about mm, 1600. Very rarely. Mm. 
Now, why have I jumped quite so far ahead? Because, honestly, one of the things about supply and refit ships is it's a lot more difficult to do this sort of thing during periods of transition. For you to have a store ship, and if, again, I go back to this, You guys didn't realize you were sending me a prop, did you? You need to be able to standardize, especially on the small bits, to have a supply ship. Because you're having to load up quite a big thing with a lot of supplies for a lot of ships. So if all your ships have different engine types, and all of them require different things, and some are sail ships, some are, uh, st uh, some are steam ships and some of some boiler one type of boiler and some of a different type of boiler and some of a different type of some paddles some repellers what do you put in your refit repair ship what can it carry in the end you just it's just so complicated the only place you're going to have enough space to store stores and that you're actually going to be able to deal with things in a viable of cost efficient way and logistically efficient way is shore bases so you can argue that the growth in empire that happens between roughly 1840 and 1910-1920 is down to the fact that you need ports. You need ports for coal, but you need port. The, what's often forget is those same coaling ports are also where you have storehouses and warehouses for your parts to maintain your fleet, because they all need their own little dongles. They all need them. They all need different bits. They don't standardize. And that's a problem. That is really a problem. However, by the time you get to the Spanish-American War, you've started to have some standardization creep in, especially in the newer navies, because they just built everything, so it's got some similarity. And it starts to make sense, because you're doing the kind of actual war-fighting operations which require you to be forward and require you to actually operate. And also, everyone's seen the Franco-Prussian War and after they see it, no one wants to see it again. It just looked embarrassing. Everyone was just crying for the French. It was just terrible. And as we all know, one of the biggest problems for the Franco-Prussian War was that the French kept having to go home. So they kept having to waste coal transiting home. They kept having to do all sorts of things to get home. It's just not good. With saw skills. Ah, and of course, then there's Chem Catcher, which the Russians procure for much a similar reason. Uh, they are going around the world to fight it. They are taking a fleet the whole way around the world to try and retake their position in the Pacific versus the Japanese. And they have no ports. They have none of those bases. So they have to take their supplies with them. So they have the Kamchaka. Kamchaka. And let's be honest. That's really not a good option. Sometimes with saw skills, was a carpenter a backup ship surgeon? Uh, y you hoped not. You hoped not. And did the car like you know, like we did the carpenter ever do double duty in as a blacksmith? Occasionally, occasionally they had to smith. They had to know iron working to the extent they needed it for their job. Certainly.
Well, it's like, they're all maybe was just in a habit of nicking things and then taking all the good ideas, which they definitely still in the habit of doing, just ask the Dutch. Hmm. And the Danish. Did the ship's carpenter repair the whole couple plating? Not as a rule. That was done in dry. That was done in dock. Uh, that they would tend to be brought out the water for. Next one, Doctor C. How much of your family are Vikings? Um. <laughs> Let me put this on. How much do you think of my family are Vikings? Frank Spano, let's see, uh, Frank, let's see, was there a pair ship the Great White Fleet? If we go back. USS Celtic was following along. Okay, in that time you would need the Great Eastern as a supply ship. Yeah, and that wasn't really a good time to have a Great Eastern as a supply ship. Uh, for example, Doctor C, was there a moment in the Ironclad era that people thought that naval ships were no longer needed because of certain emerging texts? <sighs> Let's put it this way. There is always someone who's going to tell you they found a way to make warships irrelevant. Uh, if we consider to this day... Well, no. If we consider the, the 1900s, there was the development of the torpedo, the development of the submarine, the torpedo boat. Um, Everything was going to get the war and make the warships irrelevant. In my experience, nothing has ever made a warship irrelevant. They have just changed the nature of the warships a bit, and they've added to the complexity of war. And that's the one thing about sales. People always sell. If you're ever listening to a salesman, person, they'll always tell you it's going to make life easier. There are a few things which do make life easier. Iron brew that makes life easier. A big microphone with a fluffy cover that makes life easier. It really does. A decent screwdriver. That makes life easier. Very few other things make life easier. Very few. Hang on. Well, I'd love to see the good doctor in a nautical hat for at least one minute of each hat chat. Happy Thanksgiving from the Sun Lex Colonists. Well, happy Thanksgiving, and hmm, might start that at some point. I have got a few hats somewhere. Come on, read different parts. Were metal cogs, straw propellers actually cast and heat treated on bigger bases as needed? They would actually do a huge amount of work. They would have basically foundries that would try and make them at least try and repair the ones they came, came with if not build new ones because otherwise think about it Carl you have to bring the parts out from home and your ship's not operational till it comes home so you both have to send the note back we need this part and then wait for it to be delivered and then fit it and that can take a long long time so they tended to try they weren't always successful. Sometimes they did have to do that, but 
they did at least try. Some of the civilian ships acquired by the US Navy in 1898 war became supply ships, but the other worked to, like, survey Alaskan waters. Hmm. Ah, uh, George Newman, Camp Trust Captain should have been relieved on psychiatric grounds. That presumes they have someone better to replace them. Vision. Logistics of the Great White Fleet was very poor. The fleet trainer of the USN was born from the lessons of the Great White Fleet. Uh, you need Navy supply ships and colliers and tankers. True, but let's be honest. The reason they mostly didn't have it was because they were going around the world supplied by British colliers. And then people ask, why didn't they go near Britain itself? Well, I mean, a bit embarrassing. A, you'd have got there thanks to British coal. And B, when you turned up, you'd have found yourself face to face with the Royal Navy's channels fleet going, Hello! How are you? We're both sides of you. Oh, I thought Viking was just a job description, not a race. No, Viking is a way of life. Let's be honest, when you're going a Viking, you're basically going mm, slightly aggressive armed shopping trips. You might trade with people, you might not. Depends on what happens when you get there. Sure, a particular role in warfare rarely goes away. For example, cavalry in the role they played didn't disappear. It was replaced by other things that benefit parts of the role. True. Next one, let's see. Did the UK China stations have all of their own auxiliary ships? Most stations did have an auxiliary ship or something. Oh, let's put it way. It's quite often that your easiest way to set up in a port is to send a store ship out there. Now, the Royal Navy has the habit of its store ships being old cruisers. You're going to sit there and go, why are you using cruisers? Well, cruisers are armoured. They'll often have quite a lot of space. They'll be, if you take off some of the guns, de-stow the ammunition, uh, they, you, you could have a lot of space. And they're self-propelled. And they can support things. I really don't like that shit. Let's go on. And, um, for example, this is HMS Ambrose. Now, HMS Ambrose is the mothership in this uh, sense to the fourth flotilla, to all the submarine uh, flotilla. And she was actually rare in that she was a cargo liner which was converted into a submarine depot ship. She'd actually run scheduled services between Liverpool and Brazil until the First World War. She then gets converted into an armed merchant cruiser, which she a role she serves in with some distinction from 1914 to 15, and then it becomes a depot ship. She served as a depot ship in the Royal Navy from 1917 onwards in the Far East until 1928, and then she's transferred to the Reserve Fleet. In 1938, HMS Ambrose becomes HMS Cochrane and is converted to a destroyer depot ship. She survives the Second World War and is scrapped in 1946. Now, what is the difference between a depot ship and a repair ship? Well, a repair ship is often carrying the facilities to repair other ships. Depot ships, well, they're carrying the stores and facilities to do everything which a small ship or boat, a submarine, doesn't have space for. So they have their accommodation. They have all the senior engineers, all the senior... All the things which you don't have space for on a submarine, but you actually need are on their mothership, on their depot. Now, 
Sometimes these are referred to as tenders. It's another not explanation for them, but basically, if you think about it, what does a tender on a steam train exist, a steam engine exist to do? Exist to supply and support the engine. These are the engines of war. That is their tender. That makes sense. However, it gets interesting when you have some big flotillas and you don't have that bigger depot ships. Because then one of the depot ships might be called a ten the tender of the flotilla because it'll primarily exist to accommodate personnel and do the personnel and headquarters function of the flotilla. And another ship will be called the depot ship of the flotilla because that'll primarily exist to have the support and the service and the repair functions and carry all the supplies. <sighs> and sometimes what you get is you get a depot ship wandering around in a harbour where you have three or four flotilla tenders. Because whilst they can all take a certain amount of supplies, they can't necessarily carry enough to maintain a war operational capability. Good ship. Cool ship. Your team is slightly aggressive. Yes. I'm sorry, so you mean the Vikings or the original version of Black Friday sales? Um. Think of them more as the original version of Boxing Day sales. As we have in the UK, the day after Christmas, when everything goes on sale and basically it turns into World War, well, whatever you, uh, every shopping precinct turns into a every person for themselves. No one, if you can get out of it, get out of it. It's the only way to save your soul and save yourself. Art oh, scenario. Nothing wrong. Destroy a tender, I think you mean, Doc. It can be a submarine tender as well, Knight 6831. As saying, I was expl I explained where the tender came from. You have the engines of war, and they can be called a tender as well as a depot ship. For example, where does tender name come from? I was took it as coming from tender loving care myself, but uh let's just check. In the 19th century, that is the 1800s, the Royal Navy used supply and transport ships that were outfitted and commissioned for military use as naval service were usually referred to as tenders. So that may be where it starts. But then there are boy tenders, and which are which were owned by the um, oh the people who look after the lighthouses, etc. And they were used to maintain navigate, and they used to maintain boys. So, basically, the phrase tender has been around since uh, the eighteen hundred, eight late seventeen hundreds, early eighteen hundreds. I was hoping it was something more romantic than that, but literally it seems to be just because they were for tending things. 
so they exist to care for other ships, so they exist to tend them. For example, let's see, which cruisers by name could you name? Never heard of that before. Uh, that's a bit of a large question for one which is on supply ships, but that sounds like a Sunday question, a brew ship's problem. Vision, in World War II, the RNUSN had recreational ships too, I believe. Um, some tenders did have a recreational function that they assisted with. They'd have things like cinemas, etc. set up on them. This is an example of what starts to be built in into war years. This is the USS Medusa. And again, the US Navy is mostly building these repair ships once they start to, uh, especially... That's also, there is no surprise that this ship comes into existence after the Washington Naval Treaty puts a kibosh on the idea of building any more ports or building up facilities in the islands or in the Pacific. If you can't build up the facilities, you need to take the facilities with you. So you start to go, right then, we need repair ships. We have enough ships that we can actually carry the supplies, that's why we're standardizing. But more important than that, we actually need to repair them because otherwise they're going to have to come all the way back across the Pacific. Because if you consider this, this is done in 1924. That's before Hawaii becomes anywhere near what Hawaii is by 1941. Let alone what it is by 1945. Uh, it's before the Philippines are really... Well, would, would we like to make, base anything in Manila Bay at this point? Uh, there's all sorts of options. Uh, the, these are some of the options which are being pursued because of the paucity of resources they have available when they're looking at it from a logistical point of view and an operational point of view. Hey, Dr. Trifonius. Hi, Councilor Uh da -da -da -da. Cody 85, Depot Ships and Tenders, also known as Mumboats. Mm-hmm. Shamak, UOD, first campaign test or dropped. Still waiting on more news about ironclads to missile cruisers. Hmm. Hi, Night Hammer Productions. Graham Hammer, uh, they reckon locally it was a f mm, big wave. Mm. I presume that's going back to the lifeboat discussion. And look, Boxing Day sales around, sound a lot like the US Black Friday sales. That's a Thanksgiving and official start of Christmas season. Oh, yes, it is. I'm AMC Legend 13. Fair hand, there are still light hand ascendances here. It's usually a good sign of bad weather on the way as they hide in the flow. Yeah. No good when you see the ship which is supposed to be out there maintaining everything for a bad weather has actually decided it's going to be bad enough whether it's coming in itself. So anyway, which cruisers got converted to supply ships? Can you give us some names? Oh, of course. Now, if you give me a second, I'm going to open the door up because I have a feeling there is a trainee assistant floppy research assistant just knocking at my door. If you can get in here, I'd be surprised because I have currently a rather large object in this drawer. But we'll see. Hello, my dear Hello, my dear Hello. 
No, I have. Oh. You're coming to say hello to everyone. Oh, I did think so. That's good. Come on, up you come. Come on, free, come. You have to come through to get to me. Yeah, you know. Yeah. 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 Taffer has come to say hello to you all. <laughs> Sorry about this then for a second. I know it's incredibly bad manners, but as I said, a fluffy research assistant has come to say hi. Well, a trainee assistant, fluffy research assistant. He's still learning the ropes. I'm learning not to try and knock everything on the floor of his tail. <laughs> So, which cruisers? Now, coming. Take care, everyone. Gone. Out here. Go to your city. Coming. Right. Bye bye. Take care. I quite like this new new object in the office. All right, in the Royal Navy, some especially some of the older cruisers during World War One were really used as uh, for the depot ships. Um, most famously, of course, HMS Vindictive was one of the cruisers converted. She spent much of World War Two wandering around. Doing depot ship roles. Um, but yeah. Quite a massive list, actually. Hmm, that could be a whole video in itself. Ships con cruisers converted to supply depot ships. I think I might leave that for another video. And do a, a, do a long patrol on that at some point. So anyway, I'm now just imagining putting VS of the tubes all over the Japanese super battleship. That sounds quite scary. That's good. Heard on the grapevine that the F 35B to win the drink in the mid ingested the rain cover onto the engine. That does seem to be the prevailing thing going around, but no one seems to be quite sure where that story got started. So I will wait and see what I am what is officially reported and what is officially ignored. Um, MC thirteen issue. To me, the Type eighty three looks more like a cruiser than a destroyer. That's a, uh, don't take this the wrong way, MC Legend thirteen, but. I haven't seen an official design yet for the type uh, for the Type eighty three. So, I I if anyone's got any official designs, so far the government doesn't seem to have produced anything yet officially. So, um, uh, the most designs going around are people's concepts. I know because I, me and Drac have put together a concept, which is super and weighs in at roughly twenty five thousand tons. So, uh, yeah, that's gonna be fun. You know, let's get a high pitched snap. I hope there wasn't a high pitched snap. <sighs> There's got Dr. Clark. Watch out for your ears. The Taffer thinks they're tasty and chewy. Yes, he does. You might not notice, but this ear is actually slightly, you know, it, it, it's been, um, it's been mauled, let's put it this way. I was aboard the USS Hunley AS31, purpose-built SSBN-10, the Hoylock 1982 to uh, radiological controls of it. Oof. It's a 1983. Fun times. Now, of course, this is HMS Resource, which is the Royal Navy's purpose-built repair ship, which they built in 1928. 
Again, we're noticing a sort of theme going on here. Everyone's building these things with an idea to, hang on, we think we might be having to find in the Pacific. There's an option for this one. That's the other thing you have to remember. No one wants to bear a build a repair ship. One of the interesting questions I get is people go, well, in the Cold War, they don't have repair ships. And I go, well, yes, but where would they be? You don't be, the repair ships don't do repairs at sea. They tend to be a repair ship tends to go to a bay which is uninhabited and start supplying your repairs. Well, if you think about it, in the Cold War, where's the fallback position for most ships needing supply from in the Eastern Atlantic? They're going to fall back probably to the UK. It's probably going to be Liverpool, Camel Airs, and Belfast. Harl and the Wolf. Various yards in Scotland. That's where they're going to fall back on. Do they need a repair ship sitting in those yeah, in those in those ports? Well, not in theory. In theory, there's these shipyards and lots of people with skills and capabilities that can work on them. That's the thing. A repair ship is pretty much. This. And the other picture I was going to put up in here is. If I have my have the right picture. Now, I'm going to bring up some pictures in a second. Because there is another reason why you don't have necessarily as many of these as you think you might need them. And why you have more necessarily built in World War II than you previously would have thought. The answer is because this is HMS Belfast. And this, which should now have appeared, is... I'll shrink that down a bit. This is her carpentry workshop. This is her, that's her metal workshop. And as you can see, USS Medusa is just this scaled up to an entire ship. Because destroyers and small ships don't have enough space to have all these facilities aboard. But most cruisers, battleships do. Aircraft carriers do. You forget about it, but inside a warship, especially the bigger warships, and this is something which we have going on to this day, the bigger warships often have lots of workshop space. Lots of spaces for things to be fixed and maintained. Which means, what's the purpose for a supply ship? Because you start to go, right then, well, I'm going to have a repair ship. Okay. How often is the repair ship going to be used? Versus how much cost are you justifying the spending on it? Because the setup Medusa is not cheap. The setup HMS resource is not cheap. They are useful ships. They are incredibly vital ships. But it's not cheap. So you have to be able to justify them. My number of Oh, HMS more resource. That will be fun. That's on my to make list of the future. Well, she should be. She's quite a corrector ship. I'm 
MC Fading Legend. I wonder what would modern day battleships look like now? How many missiles would they carry in? What size missiles? What guns? It's always interesting to use the power of imagination after all. It's true, but basically you've got the uh the Peter Villicky and its sisters. To give you an idea of that one. Oh. Oh. And gentlemen, was there an HMS Obscurity? I don't think there was. From memory, I don't think there was, but that might have been because it was so because it was so obscure. Um Sean quickly. Hello, Sean, I'm seeing you more. I don't see. Do you think during the Cold War and presumably to today, those cities amongst others are on the instant nuclear repair ships would be more important. I would hope so, but you see, you have to remember uh, there was the other thing, which was a reality during Cold War, in that people believed, and honestly did believe, that in any war, things would go nuclear within five minutes. And so there was no point in preparing for a long war. In fact... You will all, anyone who's listened to Bill Trumps will know that a lot of preparing for the long war is something which me and Drac and Jamie go on about quite a lot because there isn't really any preparation done for a long war. There aren't the supplies. Everything is almost based around the assumption that it will, it will be a short war. It'll be quick. Whether it's conventional or nuclear, it will be quick. Which is great, but um, the trouble is every war we've ended up fighting in... since World War II, and including World War II, and, well, since basically any war we've ever actually been fighting, ended up fighting, has gone on longer than it was supposed to. Um, there have been a few... There, there have been some wars, but let's be honest, even the Six-Day War went on a day longer than... It was supposed to in a nuclear war, because that was supposed to be five days before everyone went nuclear uh, in the Cold War scenario. So we'd have run out of supplies for that one. If you consider First World War, everyone's supposed to be home by Christmas. So let's deploy a large army to the continent and uh, let's see what they can do. Because honestly, what here's the thing. You've got two Titanic battles between multi-million man armies in both France and Russia versus Germany, and we're deploying 100,000 men, but that's critical importance to be getting there. And the fact that they actually do turn out to be important to something like the Battle of the Mons, etc., is more a testimony to the fact that the French were really, really slow on the... Um, getting things ready front than the actual utility of a hundred thousand troops during a titanic clash between millions of troops this is nothing against them but, but, but please note that's not me critiquing the soldiers themselves the soldiers are incredibly brave i'm just saying on the scale of things that the british expeditionary force at the beginning of world war one is just a case of huh? But the point is, this, the really interesting thing is that in the 1920s, when navies build repair ships, they're actually designing for the long war. You don't build a repair ship if your war's going to be over in a few weeks. You build a repair ship if it's going to be over in months. And you build depot ships, you build repair ships, supply ships, because you aren't, you don't have the space to carry the things, the sort of things on the ships involved. For example, in this case, yes, we have all these lovely, we we have these lovely, some of the class destroyers. They are lovely destroyers for the sixties. They are for the sixties, but they have the tender, the USS Klondike, with them.
and she's got lots of facilities on her for them to look after them. Lots of facilities, repair shops. She has got supplies. She's got spare parts. She's got all sorts of things they don't carry so they can be forward supported. There's a question about whether I see repair ships coming back. I don't see them coming back anytime quickly, as soon, unless fleet sizes grow dramatically. But the idea of having a tender, a, a, a tender ship, that you can forward base that can act as a, as a sort of repair maintenance ship, but also headquarters ship with extra personnel forward base in the, in the theatre, etc. on it, seems sensible to me for any long war. Because if every time your ship loses a few people due to illness or due to an accident or due to an air attack where you lose a couple of dozen people and you have to send the ship home to get new people or you have to wait until the resupply arrives, that's a ship which is down. Ideally, you want spare people as close to the battle as close to the operational theater as possible. The Falklands lasted weeks, months. I think it's a little over a month and a little over two months. The Falklands. Come on, are you off to Tank Fest next year or Tiger Day? It depends where it is versus when my mum's birthday is and where we are for my mum's birthday. My second, let's see, when you get, went to get the Tafra, I got a strange ringing in one of my ears. I have no idea why. Sometimes, oh, I'm feeling scared. It seems an LST would make a good repair ship. They did. Talk about that one shortly. Mm hmm. Mitchell Oates, tenders are interesting beasts. On the Hunley, besides the ability to service nuclear power pl pl plants and SBMs, you still had a foundry and a sailmaker's shop. Just in case. Hmm. I forget who it was who said I don't know what World War Three will be fought with, but I know that World War Four. I know what World War Four will be fought with. I think they said it was sticks and stones, which I'm not quite sure myself. I've not been quite sure if I agree with that one. Come, ah, but they didn't say which Christmas. Mm, you'd got me there. I don't think it was Einstein who said that earlier quote. Sir so Mike, I, I think it might have been the guy who came up with the. Um, uh, wasn't it Feynman who said it? I'm not sure. Uh, Shomak, I think that not planning for a long war is more a product of how eye watering the price would be to supply a Mont army in the field for a month of conflict that we are projecting. That's true, but that means you are planning to uh, failing to plan is planning to fail. It's always the case that uh, proper planning prevents P star SS poor performance. The six P's go with the six P's, and part of that is logistical prep, and part of that is these tender ships. And these supply ships, they are part of the preparation of these forces. There is no point the Royal Navy having destroyers if they don't have tenders to support them wherever they're going around the world. There's no point having submarines if you don't have tenders to support them going around the world. Rebuilding cruisers and other ships into the tender ships makes sense because they're viable hulls which have the space, have good enough engines, and it costs less, and it gives you something which is 
quite survivable in the case of people are going to be hitting them. Because again, that's the other thing the Royal Navy tends to worry about tenders. Slightly more than the US counterparts, the idea that people might actually attack their tenders. Let's see, how about drone repair ships? Well, that's the interesting thing. If you ever discussed the, the, the gun to bilge pumps, you will know uh, that in one episode, I did talk about the idea of basically an LPD, a landing platform dock, being used as a drone repair ship and sort of uh, a underway repair ship for um, uh, uncrewed surface vessels. The idea being you have basically you turn the dock into a dry dock where you have a sort of inner dock dry dock facility uh for the larger ones on one side you can dock down the aft ramp but you can still keep maybe a forward section dry uh you have for smaller vessels an entire through system so that they can be either picked up at the front, maintained, repaired, and all the things, and then dropped off out the rear, or maybe they drive in at the stern, get picked up, da -da -da -da, everything goes for, as they go through, and then whoosh, off. Or alternatively, you could have them, I suppose, if you decided to just have a single big dock and use the two small docks, so you had it, d -d 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 comes in, and then gets shifted across and dropped off the other side. That could actually work quite well, especially if you had containerized weapon systems, so you could have the containers removed on one side, loaded on the other side. That would simplify the mechanisms and logistics, and you could bounce it in the hull. And you could use the say if you had the big UK, the big you uh, un uncrewed surface vessel, be you use the same containers the smaller vessels. They just probably carry more of them, basically a standflex size system. Then you could use the same gantries for operating on both. That's a thing. HMS Unicorn. Now, why have I put her in there? Why is a forward aviation support ship, especially considering that's exactly what her, her the latter light fleet carriers converted to roll were pretty much perfectly around, why is she put in there for depot ships and store ships and tender ships? Because as part of her role, she was supposed to be a depot ship for aircraft carriers as well. So she was supposed to carry a lot of supplies, a lot of repairs, and actually repair aircraft. So take damaged aircraft off a carrier, give them new aircraft, repair those aircraft. The ones they could repair get passed on to the next carrier. The ones they can't repair get stored and taken back to shore to be repaired. So she is a forward repair and maintenance ship. Hello, Guardsman 13. Mm-hmm. Flying Thompson, would a repair ship be a peacetime force modiplier? Yes and no. We'll be talking about that probably in a bit towards the end. Don't guess, but then there is the possibility, even reality, of non-peer proxy wars when part of your fleet will be in combat deployment for months or even years. Yep. That's a problem. Uh, sorry, being absent, just being life. Uh, with the Falklands, even though the fighting ended, wasn't there a bit of a post-conflict strain place in the RN until everyone was assured of peace of Yes. And that, that's the entire reason the big group of led by HMS Bristol comes rushing down under Derek Raffel, who should have been down there from the beginning, uh, is literally to relieve the Royal Navy squadron down there because some of them are ships are falling apart and they need to get home. Sean Quimby, is that bit of stoppage time included in naval planning? What do you think? Probably included in the proper planning, but, you know. 
uh, is included in the planning which the pot uh, which gets signed off by the governments. Mm, probably not so. Sometimes I would not want to have my Cuban missile crisis ships enforcing the blockade to have to leave station due to repair need. Still a useful peacetime asset. They are still useful, but get they would try getting that budget through Congress. When they go, well, it's not that far to come back from uh, from Cuba to uh, Cal uh, to Florida. You can get maintained in Florida, and that's it. I just wanted to see, do LSDs, LPDs work as landing craft repair ships? They do to an extent, yes. Night Productions. Do you know anything about never built RN SLBM depot ship designed to maintain and provide for resolution class SBMs? I believe she was intended for Easter's sewers role to support the fifth resolution class boat that was never was. That was certainly considered. But she was more considered for them do moving to another operating base. Because, again, there was an idea that in wartime, Faz Lane and etc. might get hit hard by enemy air attacks. So you might want to set up a support base for your ballistic missile subs far away from the UK. Now, she's often considered to talk about, you know, her going down, her going out to the Far East. But I don't think she would have done with the depot ship that you're talking about that was supposed to support the resolution class, I have a funny feeling that, well, she has two options. She either winds up in Gibraltar, which is definitely a potential place. Uh, the Azores is an option, I suppose, if we go from there, maybe with Portugal providing some protection, but it's doubtful. Ascension, always a possibility, but that's kind of a strain on the supplies and maintenance down there. Or maybe even the Falkland Islands. You know, it's where do you want to operate your submarines from that you prefer them to be operating from? And yes, while she's technically for supporting the SSBN, she can also support the SSNs if they have to turn up in a, in a hurry. Especially if you can get another merchant ship out there with supplies. She has all the workshop facilities to support them. She just needs the supplies and components. Gus and have we done the cam, cam, cam tra uh, tracker yet? Uh, yes, I managed to skip through that one rather quickly. There wasn't any questions. Mm. I'd imagine, uh, sure, Mike, I imagine that studies exist, but I think nobody wants to be more the one that goes to the powers that be to ask if we could have $100 billion for logistics. You just lose. That is true, but someday someone's going to have to gonna think about it. A maintenance aircraft carrier assembly that uh, Atreus Unicorn, IJN, uh, no, no, another smaller. No, no, no. We've been over this 9681. This is a forward aviation support ship. Your eyes are lying to you. It's not an aircraft carrier. It is a forward aviation support ship. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It is a forward aviation support ship. The Royal Navy was not buying another aircraft carrier. It was an auxiliary, a forward aviation support ship they swore honestly to the government in solemn oath at many points that hms unicorn was not and could not be an aircraft carrier that she was a forward aviation support ship <clears throat> potentially template for the light carriers but we'll leave that one side Mm -hmm. <sighs> hmm. Right. And then, of course, someone's already talked about earlier. Oh, well, that weren't landing ships used that. Well, let's say because of this, this is the Zanfu class. And. Um, Xanatu repair ships. 
and I think I might have pronounced that, let's spell that wrong, so, Zanhus, yeah, uh, the S is gone, I knew there was something going wrong with that one, uh, it's supposed to be Zanthus class, this is HMS Diligence, one of the Royal Navies, and these repair ships were built for the Royal Navy by Bethlehem Fairfield Shipyard in 1944, but uh, they were built under lend lease, and the only diligence and assistance were originally reload to a loan to the Royal Navy. The rest were kept by the US Navy, and they were found to be quite useful. They're an actual proper class. Whereas most of the rest have been one off ships. And the Royal Navy had requested them as heavy duty fleet repair ships. They are. Mm, how do I put this? They're an adaptation of actually Liberty hulls, although they do look like, to an extent, from an angle, landing craft hulls, landing, sh landing ship hulls, I should say. And that's probably because they all have a sort of similarity in their hull shape. Mainly because they eventually used the Luzon class as a sort of basis. But... They don't actually get... How do I put this? The trouble is they all arrive quite late. So, for example, Diligence arrives in Britain in 1945. Assistance arrives in 1945. Assistance, uh, assistance is returned in 1946. So is Diligence. So they don't really get to be used as they're properly supposed to be used. But these ships were had absolutely colossal facilities aboard them. And they would have been pretty darn cool. They ended up doing extensive service during the Korean War. Uh, both assistance and diligence spent most of their time as AR-17 and AR-19 in the National Defense Reserve Fleet. But Xanthus, Laertes and Dinosaurus all saw Fairly extensive service with the United States. Um, Dionysus was recommitted, was, mm, how to put it, operated between Enui Katol and Tokyo Bay between July and September 1945 before being decommissioned, recommissioned in 1952, joining the Atlantic Fleet. Um, Laertes was recommissioned after being decommissioned in 1946 ish. She's recommissioned in 1951 to support operations in Korea, operating from the Japanese port of Sespo and the Korean point of Busan, repairing ships of the 7th Fleet. Sanfus, she basically uh, operates out of Okinawa until January 1946, then sails to China, supports American naval activities over there, then is withdrawn in April, sent to the National Defence Reserve Fleet. They do consider activating her in 1951, but they don't. And as said, Dionysus is activated in 52, Laertes in 1951, but they look at diligence assistance in Xanthus, and they don't activate any of them in 1951, even though they do consider it. And eventually they are pretty much all sold for scrapping in the 1970s, Apart from Dionysus, which was sunk as an artificial reef in 1978. I'm not quite sure about this class because they are, it's quite disturbing to see that a lot of people are um, naming things again after Greeks. And when I say Greeks, I mean ancient Greeks. And technically, Xanthus is named after one of Achilles' horses, which speaks of a human voice. 
I'm not sure why this is relevant to naval operations, but that's what they name it for. Jimmy, I you can. I thought I was a uh, 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 I thought I was a sure bombardment ship with an aircraft maintenance capability. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, show me. I ignore that, that they revenge uh, rearrange the deck chairs and call them like free carriers. Just she, just me laughing like crazy does. Mm. Uh, my it looks like an aircraft carrier. An HRT Yukon was used an aircraft carrier. Nineteen seventy one. Whatever that may be, I will be honest with you. This is a forward aviation support ship. So, look, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, Knight Six Eight Three One. It's I I I can understand. You can be confused if you put it next to a Colossus class light fleet carrier. There is a similarity, but I have it on the word and the honor of people like Admiral Henderson, Admiral Cunningham. Pound, Blackham, all sorts of senior officers testified that this was a forward aviation support ship and not an aircraft carrier. Even when she functions as an aircraft carrier, technically she's acting as she's being used as a command and support ship for escort carriers. The fact that she carries a bigger air group than any of them will lead to one side. It you know, that's not, she is supporting them. She's not an aircraft carrier. You know, you're not letting history, you know, and actual reality make you question the word and honour of the Royal Navy on what they, that they know what their ship is. Uh, George Newman and Dr. Which systems the Yukon lack fully or partly compared to a proper carrier of her size? Um... She only had four inch AA guns instead of four point five inch guns. Yeah, um, that tells you she's she's an auxiliary. Uh, let me just check. Uh, she could only carry 33 aircraft if she was operating them um sort of you know that's what 33 fully constructed aircraft was a maximum load uh, she only had a top speed of 24 knots because she only had four water tube boilers and two shafts and two steam turbines uh, maximum range of 7,000 nautical miles at 13 and a half knots she did end up having radar. Um, yeah, four twin six, uh, uh, four twin four inch uh, dual purpose guns, four quadruple pom poms, um, two twin eight single oroclons. She had armor, but only 50 millimeters of armor on her flight deck and. 76 millimeters of armor on her magazines and 38 millimeter armor on her bulkheads. You know, the normal stuff. Nothing excessive. And...
And she did have a catapult capable of launching a 14,000 pound aircraft. But remember, she is a forward aviation support ship. And to quote my good friend, Jamie Seidel, The, 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 the discussion is as below. Unicorn, as completed, was in many respects indistinguishable from an active fleet carrier. This presented a problem. The UK had already filled its treaty quota of combat cable carriers. The degree of hand rigging and reading between treaty lines, the Naval Law Department recommended Unicorn still be classified as auxiliary. After all, that was the intention designed to support carriers in much the same way armed tenders supported submarine and destroyer flotillas. The fact she looks like an aircraft carrier was a necessary consequence of her capabilities and didn't destroyer tenders with their destroyer lines and armament look like stretched destroyers? They very nearly ordered free. <laughs> That's an interesting World War II. If the RN orders three unicorns at the get-go, and at the same time as it orders the free illustrious class, because that has an interesting impact on things. It really does. But remember, it's a forward aviation support ship. Not an aircraft carrier. And in fact, my next conference paper, which I probably do at some point, might well be about HMS Unicorn. And her career. It's right, I suddenly realized, I just realized, next year will be the 4th anniversary of the Falklands War. Yeah. Do you have any pics from on board these kinds of ships? I'm having trouble picturing what they would look like. Well, this is the inside of Medusa, which is basically a massive workshop. And I have some pictures from the machinery workshop of HMS Belfast. So this is pretty much what you're dealing with. Lots and lots of spaces like this. Lots and lots of workshop spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think the good doctor covered it fairly well. Thank you. But essentially, it was a sport ship considered by the MD and the Admiralty to support their SSBN subs, the resolution class, uh, mainly to carry and reload the Polaris missiles. Hmm. Pretty much to carry the missiles, but also to provide them with some other functions of support and maintenance. Falklands War. Mm. It's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting one. Nine hundred. Pretty much the same reason most things like the CVO and the Philbo seven sixties. Um, not so much money, but yes, money. It's how do I put it. It's not that the government's necessarily short of money. It's just they don't want to spend in the money they have. Uh, one of the interesting questions you get is, what does the government want to spend its money on? It wants to spend its money on things at home, so it wants to get the maximum diplomatic and political value from the minimum amount of defence spending, and it decides it can do that by spending on the central front. So that's why CVO one etc. get crushed. <sighs> uh... 
Sure, Matt. Do you have the minutes from the government hearings about that? Because that would be some fun stuff to read. If you want to, you can go and uh, find the minutes and discussions of her uh, from Hansard on the website, on, on the Hansard site. That's awesome. How many unicorns are not carrying the same way that the Jap uh, Japanese maritime self-defense Hugas are helicopter destroyers, not carriers? Hmm. Senator, who do you believe? The Admiralty or your own lying eyes? That's a question. <laughs> Hello, Hayek Bengal. Whistling innocently. Yeah. Sam Thompson, a unicorn looks like a hospital ship uh, to me. Where is the Red Cross? That would be tempting. John Shake, why does every ship in, in uh, every time a ship in is named other something someone from ancient Greece, it turns out that the name has more than weird in a very disturbing way origin? I have no idea. Why is it? They, 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 seriously, you're going, you, you know, you, you, there are some names which you can sort of get away with, but there are others you just go, why? Dan Freeman, HMC Ally, Dan, not a fleet, uh, uh, HMC, not up to fleet speed at all. Looks of the R class, Null Rods and Upgraded Queen, Local class, totally not up to fleet speeds. Yeah, pretty much, mm, Unicorn could sort of keep up with them in terms of their, cr their cruising speed, just about. We are worried our mates in the ship might get knocked about a bit and had some spare bits of steel lying around, so thought we'd use those. Mm-hmm. I know. Well, the Wikipedia pages, HMS Unicorn as an maintenance aircraft carrier, and HMS Percy and Pioneer as a reclassified as aircraft maintenance, classified as aircraft maintenance ships. Yes, and Wikipedia may or may not be correct, but that's not what the Royal Navy classified her as at the time. What she subsequently might have been retroactively classified due to changes in circumstances during World War II is not up to the Royal Navy when they are procuring her. When they are procuring her, she is procured, and at this time and in this role, as a forward aviation support ship, and is not procured as anything more. And if you want to know what that sounds like, if you go and watch a program called Yes, Minister, you will hear a gentleman called Sir Humphrey speak like that very regularly. This is Britain. This is how we operate. Still. That room. We need the catalog. So how will we be able to uh, check if the aircraft are back working if we can't test them? That is true, but also the other thing was... Well, then it's uh, easier for a rough sea transfer of aircraft from our carrier from the maintenance ship to the aircraft carrier. Uh, you have uh, to damage the aircraft have to be taken across by tender, of course, but repaired aircraft and new aircraft can be transitioned back by air. Nice Wait, they could have got three unicorn class aircraft for ship ships. Yes, the Royal Navy was originally asking for three, but eventually, with treasury arguments and lawyers, they only ordered one. Which is why it's one of those other things. If you'd had three started off, that would have accelerated production of air in entry of aircraft. If you think about it, if three unicorns had come into service at pretty much the same time as they would have done in roughly 1943. Uh, straight after the illustrious, is that would have really helped the Royal Navy with carrier shortage in 1943. In terms of being able to properly supply and support those carrier, uh, the carriers they did have at sea, and maximise the capability of them as only a forward aviation support ship could. In fact, what you would probably do is you would probably have each armoured carrier operate with its own dedicated forward aviation support ship sailing around with it. And 
whilst that might, to the untrained eye, look like a multi-carrier task group. It's not. No, 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 no. It is mainly a. It is merely an enhanced operating group where you have a support ship ready to support your fleet carrier. I think someone posted personal photos of the USS Vulcan on YouTube. I think they did. I, I, I have heard some things about that. And going around. Oh, AR5, USS Vulcan. Now, she was a long-service ship. It's quite interesting to compare these two. The Vulcan. End of service in 19... Laid down 1939, launched 1940, commissioned 1941, and is not decommissioned until 1991. And this actually is a picture taken over in June 1992. She sold from scrap in 2006. And again, it's one of the interesting things for the Japanese, and I do have to admit, I do have an idea what's coming up for the my 7th of December, because I've been working out what I'm going to do around about Pearl Harbor, because I have a long patrol going out that day, and I want to handle it sensitively, but I also, because I don't want to, you know, cause a huge upset for all the veterans groups if I'm looking at Pearl Harbor, but I also want to do a sort of a good look, a, a good look at it and something different. And uh, yeah, I am, there are a few things coming around, but and Kashi is an interesting one, because, honestly, it doesn't really make sense when you do a prima facie reading of the Kantai Kesson Doctrine. Because you're supposed to be falling back towards your own harbours and doing it in your own side of the Pacific. Why do you need a supply ship, a support ship? But actually, when you think about it, for the most high risk part of the Kantai Kesson doctrine, it's going to be the withdrawal back. It's going to be the engagements, the long, uh, the sort of the guerrilla action where you're trying to wear down the uh, American forces, and you have to be quite careful of that because you want to wear them down enough that you are able to meet them in battle as theoretically equals. But not so much that they actually withdraw. Because then you've wasted your opportunity and they're only going to come back even stronger. Which is going to make your task even more difficult. So having a forward maintenance, a, a, a maintenance ship that can allow you to rapidly repair destroyers, etc. In the, in the forward operating areas makes a lot of sense. Because your destroyers, and especially your experienced destroyer crews, are going to be critical. And also resupplying torpedoes is an absolute nightmare. Frank Smart, don't, say, don't the Russians have a hundred year old repair, plus year old repair ship built by the Tsar? Yeah, something, I think. Sean Quigley, hmm, any chance the RN trying for another year in corn nowadays would actually make sense with the modern ships? It would, wouldn't it, with Queen Elizabeth class? But you'd need enough aircraft to justify procuring it. And probably we'd more likely to get an HD. I'll be getting into that discussion in a bit. Anyway, modern supply ships. Well, we have Fort Victoria. Now, she's a store ship. And this is the point. Once you start to have plug-and-play store ships and 
replenishment at sea. Well, a large chunk of your operations goes away. Because, especially as ships grow bigger, you have more spaces on modern ships like this. So if this can supply you the necessary supplies to take out components and replace them with new components if they have to come in box form, or with the materials that you can adapt in these facilities to the form you need them, then you don't need the repair ships. You don't need the supply ships. How come over repair ships? Yes, work description. One. What have they done to it? Two. Inspect damage. Develop a, he a headache. Three. Appeal to an, uh, a deity. Hammer. Cut. Appeal to more deities. Hammer again. Four. Hammer. Weld. Hammer again. Paint. Go get lubricated. That seems sensible. Shomak, yes, I'm not sure I heard that correctly because my dog was going crazy, but did they just argue that destroyer tenders have destroyer-like lines? If so, that's an argument only a lawyer would make. That is the case, yes. But that was the important point. It was going to be made by lawyers in international law. And as I will tell you, anyone who ever listens, international law is mostly not written yet, and it's interesting and fun. On a regular basis. May MC Legend 13. Thrawn and Tarkin in charge of the Royal Navy during Cold War. How would the RN and Cold War Royal Navy look? They looked. Uh, there wouldn't have been a Soviet Union by the end of it. And probably CVA-01 would have been built. And there might have been a small revolution against certain governments. Ashi is a good ship. I think I discussed that. Um... It looks like the fluffy researchers can handle spelling on some slides. Potentially, I have to admit, while putting this together, the joy of dyslexia sometimes means I do, I do miss stuff, but more importantly, sometimes I just make mistakes. In this case, some of these slides, I have to admit, if I go back to um, this one, could be the Xanthus class, it's just I put it together and I did notice when I read through because it was close enough. And that's the trouble. If Sometimes you have chance to put a slides together and you have time to lead them and go back to them. Sometimes you don't. This week I've had other projects taking up my time. So this one got... Well, mostly it got written yesterday. Gentlemen, I wonder if the UK ever thought of fully, uh, a forward fully armoured aviation ships, aviation cruisers. Um, there's so many things. <laughs> are we, oh, Candeliver, or are we at pu uh, purpose built repair ships only right now? We've only just really got to them, and they only really had them built during World War Two, And most of the ones like Vulcan, which last of the time it did, they're mostly ships which were around from World War Two. Most of people didn't need them. You see, in peacetime prior to World War Two, you had tender ships. And that's the other thing again. If we go back to these ships, you know, if we look at this one, this is a forward repair ship. It's got huge cranes on all those sorts of facilities. But if we go back to, let's say, a tender, she has big cranes on her. That's another thing. Why do I need a repair ship which has workshop space when My cruisers and above have spaces like this on them, lots of them. And my destroyers and submarines tend to have depot ships with them. And so any facilities which I don't have enough of in terms of 
my own ships I might be able to use one of depots or one of land bases for, which is going to be a lot cheaper for me, especially in peacetime when I have to make the case of funding as a proportion of the national budget, and I don't have a ready enemy to focus on, than building it and building a specialist ship. I bet a modernized Atrimus Unicorn would have been assigned to Atrimus Victorious. Probably. Sam Thompson. IJN Akashi was a repair ship. IJN Kashi Akashi was a big keg ship for the class 6 stores. Akashi. Um. Yeah. Akashi. Akashi. I might be pronouncing the name wrong, but that is the right spelling. Sure. Ignore that when the USN got light carriers, they used them in the same manner to task group with large carriers. Completely ignore that. That's not their role. They're, they're forward aviation support ships. Stop trusting your eyes over what the Royal Navy tells you. It's not good. Believe the Royal Navy. Senator, I'm afraid the British is my of influence to me, and my presentation about AA will be like you talking about a unicorn. Mm -hmm. Potentially. George, sounds like routine government speak. That's what we try for. So, in 1960, so Shinano is a Ford Aviation ship. No, she was an aircraft carrier. If they, That's what the Imperial Japanese Navy called her. A, 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 an aircraft carrier. They may have they may have done that a bit, but the independence class also ran their own strikes and added their planes to those their own, as well the strikes. Yeah, kind of like Adrian's Eagle. Those This is basically lawyer speak, Royal Navy edition. How to blow new sausage yourself out of trouble? We try. Sure, quickly. USS Vulcan and other repair ships had a sad end. They were used by a charlatan to grab mi uh, grab monies from the um, ship's veterans who promised a massive disaster response fleet museum organization that folded. That's rather cruel. Take care, Sean, quickly. Now, assuming they would su they survived till near war's end, could the RN have repurposed glorious encroaches to repair ships for aircraft and Pacific Fleet? Probably, they were bigger than Furious, and they're better. They had better sort of engines and better designs than Furious. Furious had to be adapted too many times. Or like Furious, would they likely be too worn out by that point? They would probably have been used if they'd still been around. Hi, Sean. Take care, Sean. Quickly, that's good. Three hundred year old Russian ship. I know the uh, I know the Admiral Kozlov often looks, moves, and falling apart like a hundred year old ship, but she's really only forty years old. Frank, let's see. Have your dogs actually provided you with any meaningful research assistance? Frank, you are completely misunderstanding the concept of academic titles if you're actually holding them to actual meaningful research assistance. Besides, uh, in the case of at least one of them, they are very good at when I say sit there, they will ha allow me to balance a book on their head. The trainee assistant, floppy research assistant, is in training. At some point, we might get there. So, uh, show me. I'll post in the video suggestions, uh, okay, uh, but a career swap for Henderson and Fisher Fisher, or Fisher and Henderson, go into the first, second, or Cold War. Oof. See which, Unicorn carried a small force of fighters for self-defense. How large was it? Usually roughly 18. 
uh, fighters plus 18 strike aircraft. And once they started using fighters for the strike, we're all roughly 36 air strike air uh, 36 fighters. Usually C fires. Um, the USN often use escort carriers for uh, ferrying replacements, uh, but their repair capabilities were limited as Steve Winish does. Mainly, again, they use their they use the islands for the repair facilities. So mm, the Americans tended to build it on the uh, the islands. And again, this also reflects the fact that the Americans had such a flow of new aircraft coming across, they could often just tip the aircraft over the side and replace them because they were in. Uh, again, it. It reflects the differences of war planning from the British and the American doctrines and geostrategic positions in the 1920s and 30s. The Americans are looking at fighting the other side of the Pacific, which is a long way, but it's still only one ocean away. To, you know, from the eastern to the west, uh, from the eastern side of the Pacific to the western side of the Pacific. The Royal Navy they're looking at fighting the other side of the world from their infrastructure base. So they are looking at needing to do uh, keep to try and keep their aircraft and as many air groups as operational and aircraft operational as possible. They're looking at doing more repairs and more intensive repairs forward because the supply is going to take that much longer. So that's why the Royal Navy has a forward aviation support ship. Wouldn't these supply ships be a great candidate for automation? Um, yes and no. Uh, quite correct, Dan Freeman. Jackoon, hey Dr. Clark, when do you plan to release the Bilge Pump episode about the Zerd plan? Just curious as I would like to hear yours and Jamie's opinion on it. We're doing one on Task Force Zerd, Z. Uh, we haven't done one yet on the Zerd plan. We haven't yet recorded that one. We are looking at it, thinking about it. It's if we can persuade. You see, the thing is with the Zerd plan is that Jamie would classify it as a what if. So we have to work on him to get him to do that. Basically, I have to send a large amount of um lubricant to Jamie's wife and ask for some of it to be administered to Jamie in order to get him to do a what if scenario or Drac has to send it one of us has to we were we just run an iron brew he requires something stronger Mitchell, I saw the smaller hatred towards Hunley as the as the thing had a stack fire and crankcase explosion going across the North Atlantic to Holy Lock in January eighty two with myself on board. Ooh, fun times! Dorsey, what were some of the most maintenance heavy and light aircraft the USN RN had in World War Two? Seafire, uh, seafire, seafire for most maintenance intensive of all three, but the Douglas Dauntless was also pretty intensive. Um. Least intensive probably is a swordfish. But also the Hellcat was quite good. Mm, the, Cor uh, the Corsair comes somewhere in the middle. Lubricant? Yes. Iron Brew lubricates me. Keeps the mind whirring. I don't know what dirty thing you guys are thinking about, but this is lubricant.
Vision, what if Task Force Z had Unicorn for good luck? If Task Force Z had had Unicorn, which... It... Let's put it this way. Unicorn is stopped by the same decision that stops the aircraft carrier, the illustrious class being built. So, if Churchill doesn't make that decision, Unicorn would probably have been in service about the same, would probably have been in service about 1940, possibly 1941, but probably 1940. 19, early 19, uh, let's say early 1941. In which case, she might well have been the spare aviation the ship sent over with Task Force Z. Z. Uh, she might well have been the spare ship sent because she would have been available. And she could have provided them with fighter support. Yeah, which Helldiver was supposed to be a hanger queen. She, they were a hanging queen, but that was mainly because their parts, when they went wrong, they had a habit of not being able to find spare parts for. Ah, uh, Argus. Now, why have I put... Argus here. Why have I gone British suddenly? Because I've been talking about quite a fair amount of ships and wandering around, but I've suddenly gone very British. Well, because to an extent this this and this Diligence, which was another support supply ship, which basically spent most of its time actually supporting minesweepers, but also Supporting submarines and other ships around the world are all being replaced by this, which is also supposed to replace the LPDs. That's the landing platform docks and the literal strike ships, perhaps, which is the one up in the corner, which hasn't been even been built yet. Provide a hospital ship. Uh, landing plat of the um bay class LSLs, and there's conversation of the Royal Navy actually buying up to six of these. You notice one design here doesn't have a dock, this design does have a dock, okay. So what did the sea fire look like? Well, I'm going to deal with that joyous thing before I actually get into this joyous thing, then. Ugh. Sea fire is actually more joyous. Let's see. A sea fire. Right then, let's get that picture up. And yep, this is what a sea fire looked like. It's a Spitfire. Which has had minimal adaptations. Minimal adaptations. And as you can see, this one has run into the net. Which suggests it's missed what it was supposed to be getting. And the reason I say I think it's run into the net is because there's actually ropes going along the wings, etc. Whereas... Theoretically, tail hook supposed to be holding it down. And it also looks like I, I think that might be a prop blade has gone flying off into the air. I'm not sure. That might just be the camera. But that does look like a prop blade has gone shearing off because of the um, net.
but that's a C file. <laughs> That's hearing. What was it about the Helldivers handling that the UK hated? Um, honestly, I can't remember, but I'm fairly sure Brown writes a whole section of it. Name Spitfire has never been used again. Just thinking about the Swordfisher maintenance, the Nelsonian Navy could have probably done 90% of the maintenance for them. Wood, canvas. Uh, I think in that picture, don't take this the wrong way, the undercarriage isn't broken yet. Give it a couple more minutes. <laughs> so, this is the multi role support ship. Now, as a rule, you one of the things you'll often hear me argue for is buying more ships that do multiple roles than buying a couple of ships that do specialized roles. However, you have a big problem here. I don't have a problem with these replacing RFAs. They can do that. In terms of the fort class, I think it could be adapted to do that role. I would like to see it with a heavy... Uh, heavy lift system so it can do actual transfers to keep the carrier going but okay they are talking about it having that i can see it potentially if it's got a dock replacing a bay class but that's going to take up a lot of space so that's a trade-off but you need it if you want to replace the bay class i can see it being used as a hospital ship i like the idea of having one of them roll as a hospital ship and I can see them being used as a literal strike ship. I could see them fulfilling that role because they've got the capabilities to do that, especially if you do have a bay, a, bay, a, a, a dock at the back, then there's a literal strike ship. They become great. They can position themselves offshore with the required vehicles, helicopters, and if they have the facilities aboard to sustain their personnel, then they're perfect. However... Where I get into a problem with these is when you start replacing the Al Albion and Bulwark with them. Because whilst Albion and Bulwark are incredibly compromised designs when you deleted the hangar deck, deleting the hangar deck and the main gym they were supposed to have and the other enhanced medical facilities was one of the most penny-smart, uh, penny smart pound-foolish ideas ever known to mankind. But the thing is, it's what leads you to thinking that this might be viable. To replace them. If I had to replace Albion and Bulwark tomorrow, I would be replacing them with LHDs. I would make them naval manned and naval crewed. Because again, if you're designing a ship to be crewed to naval standards versus RFA, that's a different stand uh, it's a different crewing protocol, it's a different shaping of the hull. And I know people are going, people keep using the example of the Harry the Wolf class and going, well, they work for the Canadians. Yes, but they're talking about patrol ships doing a very similar role. Albion and Bulwark, that's a military, that's a very strong, that's a very forward naval role where they have to have command, they're doing command, culture, uh, command, and they are going to be a priority target. If these ships are manned the same, uh, look the same, they're going to also be a priority target. In which case, in my mind, you either end up with the justification of making them all naval manned and they need to be protected to naval standards because they're all going to be priority targets once you get close in shore. Or you don't have them as that. I would like six of these. I think six of these could work very well to fulfill the, 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 the other roles. 
I would honestly like more than six. I think you, if you're looking at the forwards that support strike ship role, if you're looking at the aircraft carrier sustainment role, you're talking at least three ships for each of those roles. If you want to be able to do the hospital ship and you want to be able to do the bay class role, I think you are talking about, in my mind, at least nine, possibly 12 ships. All RFA, and that's fine. They can be manned and used to that in the RFA manner. That would make perf be perfectly fine and perfectly sensible. And they could be slim down crew, as viable as they can be viable. And then they could replace the Bay class, the Fort class, Argus, Diligence. They could replace all those quite and fulfill those functions. But you need enough holes to do that job. That's the case I'm making. But Albion and Bulwark, I think, is a step too far. I think if you're going to replace those, they need to be replaced properly. You need something with those command facilities because they're going to be task group hubs. It's often forgotten just how much command facilities are in Albion and Bulwark, but it's a humongous space. Uh, honestly, if I show you, if the big, if we get the picture uh, right up to full size, honestly, you could probably take, if you look at HMS Albion up the top there, if, oh, in my book, I think it's Albion, uh, but Honestly, the command center space is probably as the length of the ship between the two uh, of uh, from the forward of the uh, forward part of the forward tunnel to the aft part of the outer tunnel. That's that's how big we're talking about in area and footprint it takes up, and it is more than just one one big room. There are lots of facilities on there. It is a huge star space. It also carries a very large number of troops and a very large number of vehicles. And whilst the current in vogue is that future strike capabilities are going to be, oh, basically it's the Commando 2021 vision is basically the Royal Marines becoming a rather heavily armed version of the Special Forces in some respects. Mm, history has a habit of reminding us quite regularly that every time we get rid of amphibious shipping, because it's never going to be done like that again, it gets done like that rather quickly. And the thing is, I think you can get away with smaller ships like this, providing the bulk of your amphibious force, if you have some big ships to form it as round as a colonel. And I don't want to have... Uh, let's be honest, we're not going to use the aircraft carrier for that role. Because as short of aircraft as we might be in F-35s, the odds are, even if we can't provide all the air wing, and I hope we would be able to provide the majority of the air wing, our allies will want to use those uh, the other carriers for the air wing, and we will be a convening power with that carrier. But that's it as a strike carrier, not as it's an amphibious ship. It's, I love the amphibious, uh, the, the Queen Elizabeth class, but I don't want to take them that close into shore to be uh, used as amphibious ships. I don't want to tie them up that much, and I don't want to have them that visible that close from the shore. So there's also the other advantage that a fully worked up LHD is a backup for your aircraft carrier. If you don't have an aircraft, if you, if you for some reason you don't have an aircraft available, you can use an LHD to fulfill some of the roles of air defense of your task group. Let's go. If this dual role hospital ship LSD, does it complicate the line between the non combatant hospital ship and the combatant LSD a bit too much? Not particularly, because you just have one rolled. And as you've seen this one, that one's up there is painted white with red crosses on it. Sometimes, was a cam hurricane modified for sea duty? No. Other than fitting it to the, its launch carriage? No.
MC Legend 13H. Speaking of LHDs, what an unfortunate fate HMS Ocean. She, she was still capable. Uh, she still was a capable ship. It was unfortunate she was sold. Yeah, she was a good LPH. Excellent. Dr. C, how many repair tenders would you recommend for how many warships? Well, the, the, as I said, I was working through it, and if I was replacing the free bays like for like, that's free ships. If I want to replace the fort ships for the carriers, and I, I really need three of them, so that gets me to six. I want two literal strike ships, so that's one forward of the, so I probably need three ships for that role, so that's nine. To keep the two forward. As their fleet or uh, their RFAs, it's a slightly different operating and generating force generations technique uh, and technique and it's 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 different. And you can also use the wider fleet as part of a generation. So with your nine, you can do it. And then if I want to be able to do the hospital ship roll, that gets me to ten. And if I want to be able to do diligence roll and support uh, split tenders, etc. I probably need another two ships. And then, if I've got 12 ships, which are all multi-roll, and I can reconfigure them, then usually from 12 ships, I can guarantee four forward in their places, and four at various points, uh, at operational within the certain operating areas. Especially if I have them forward-based anyway, I can achieve far more. So, if I have a group of 12, I can cover six, I, I can have six or seven in active jobs from the RFA. So that covers what I need for my bay class. That covers what I need for hospital ship. That covers what I need for diligence. That covers what I need. And this is the thing. With RFAs, you can do that with a slightly smaller group. You can get force generation across a larger group. And this is another reason why I often go, when people go, oh, I want to, we need six of this and six of this and six of this. And I go, why don't you just build 18 of one? Well, that's not as good in these roles. But if you build 18 let's say 18 frigates you guarantee you have six ships available but more often than not you're going to have more than six ships available because if you think about it you usually have it in thirds of six 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 well six will be in various stages of refit but again if you have a large enough group 18 rather than occasionally having to skip refit because you need to surge force etc you will less often have to surge ships because you have that larger pool to draw from so that means you have that are more regular refits, which means you can more predict which ones are going in, going out, and which ones are going to be available. And then you have the six fits in training, transition ships in training, transition, all these things. Well, from those, you can pull ships to support your active fleet. So this is why having a larger pool of 70% ships is better than having several small pools of 100% ships. Or rather, a larger pool of 75% ships, as most general publisher ships are is often better than having a, a small a lots of small pools. Because lots of small pools, you're dipping in, I need that, need that, need that, need that, and dipping in, and going to, 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 to form your task groups. Whereas big pool, you're just going in going, I need big log of water. I need three of you. Doesn't matter which three, you can all do the jobs. You'll be designated anti-submarine, you'll be designated this, but go. Take care, Nook. Enjoy your holiday meal. Matty Current, who else had the support carriers? Mm, only really British. Only really the British. Trent Lincoln. I really don't like this falling together of naval logistics and amphibious shipping. It's an excuse to build fewer ships, which will bite whoever follows the logic in the assets. Yep. That's good. Uh, but for example, if it's being tracked by a sonar by a submarine, how does the submarine differentiate between acting as a hospital ship and acting as an LSD? Usually they have to be broadcasting. And a submarine is supposed to check by periscope, if necessary, if it is a hospital ship. So if it's one of the ships which is marked as a hospital ship and a type designated as a hospital ship, uh, it can get problematic. But there again, 
That's as long as your opponent is following the same rules as you are. So that's, um, sorry. So I've just popped to the door. I will expand this again. And then I will come back. Sorry. Where do you touch my door? Hold on. <laughs> Oh, call cool, over. Okay. Sorry, Fox has been on demolition run again. I don't know. The foxes in my area seem to delight in trying to destroy things. Oh. The other problem with this is um, if the British lead, at what point do the Americans end up following? Or at least trying out the idea. Uh, Pigeon, no Queen Elizabeth or Prince of Wales in San Carlos Water, why ever not? Mm. <sighs> Night of Karen, why did no one else accept the British Bill Ford Ocean Support Ships? Japan was trying to do that with Shinano. Well, Shinano was many, many things, but I wouldn't really call her a forward aviation support ship. I'd call her more the last desperate attempt to try and build an aircraft carrier. Unfortunately, it came too late. Um, I would say the British are trying to build a forward aviation ship. Uh, the only ones who need to do it are the British, because again, it's logistics. It's a forward aviation support ships are a product of a specific logistical and geostrategic circumstance. Where is the British industrial hubs in Britain? Where are they preparing to fight a war in the Pacific? That is a long, long way, and that's a long ch a supply chain which is going to take a long time. for trips. And if you have functioning the idea of what happens if Italy gets involved in the war, well, that's going to lengthen your supply chain, because instead of them going through the Mediterranean, the Suez Canal, which is quite quick, they might have to uh, relatively quick. They have to go all the way down the coast of Africa and round. Okay. And... So the British end up going with this construction because of that distance. For the Americans, they don't need to worry about it so much because they're building so many aircraft and their plan is always based around this sort of idea of mass production of things that they're just taking out whole carriers worth of new aircraft in such a regular conveyor belt that all that happens is, oh yeah, the plane won't work. Hey, send for a new one. All right.
The Allied support and logistics task force vessels at Okinawa are grouped to all, uh, grouped together in what's called Support and Service of the Units Task Force 50. Uh, there's a Search and Reconnaissance Group, which is made up of Task Group 50.5, which is seaplane tenders. And there are three largest ones, three smallish ones. Mm, well, four smallish ones, a couple of destroyer tenders, and uh, actually escorted by the defensive parts destroyer. Then there's task group 50.8, which is logistics support group 50, uh, which is escort support escort carriers. There are two of those, and some plane transport units, and then the logistics and supply vessels, which are. 49 oilers, 16 ammunition ships, 9 cargo ships, 8 hospital ships, 6 reefers, that's not store ships, 2 survey ships, 2 store issue ships, 9 gasoline tankers, i.e. aviation fuel, 6 station tankers, 10 repair ships, and uh, this includes Vestral, Aristus, Nestor, Oceanus, Anchor, Clamp, Current, Deliver gear and shackle, six floating docks, ARD 13, ARD 22, ARD 27, 28, 4, AFD 14, and AFDL 32. 12 fleet tugs, that's Akira, Chiksa, Chiksaw, Kree, Lepan, Matako, Menomi, Munsi, Panka, uh, Tawani, Pekasa, Tenio, and Ute. Four ocean tugs and three ocean tugs uh, for rescue duties. Just looking down the list of ships sunk to see if there's any. Well, there's some cargo ships are sunk. But they don't seem to be ones attached to the, uh, the supply fleet. Destroyer transport? Mm, not really. Not one of those. Oh, Curtis, seaplane tender. Is sunk by a... Um, well, isn't sunk, but is attacked by a uh, kamikaze and bomb. Ouch. All right, then. Some of you will notice what's gone beside me. MC Legend 13. I'm kind of surprised the RN hasn't made any corvettes as they are similar smaller, so aren't as expensive as frigates, so could be built more numerously. MC Legend 13 H, that's presuming that the Royal Navy would get the same budget. To quote, uh, many people often go, well, the Royal Navy should have built small, more smaller aircraft carriers than the Queen Elizabeth class. Well, if they were going to get the same tonnage of smaller aircraft carriers, they might have considered, although they'd have been less efficient ships and less capable ships. But the thing is, the Royal Navy was told they could have two aircraft carriers. No one said how big or how small they could be. So the Royal Navy had to divide its operations around having two aircraft carriers. That's why they end up being bigger ships. The Royal Navy, there's a big fuss of being made, the Royal Navy going back more north of having more than 19 escorts. If we consider it, if you have six Type 45s, eight type 26s that takes you up to 14 five type 31s so we're waiting for a type 31 a 32 to get us to north of uh, nine, uh, north of 19 escorts because at the moment that's what we're building we're building eight uh, eight type 26s five type 31s so it's only the type 32s which are going to get us north of 19 
Earth squad, it's not good for the hospital ship, but there again, also hospital ships tend to be transmitting and broadcasting things, and uh, it's a case of uh, you don't want to hit a hospital ship, so you try your best to make sure you don't. How do you know Juan Rodriguez? Um, hello, getting here really late. Uh, going to have to couple hours of fun today, today. That's good. Trevor, uh, FYI, Dr. Lot, the USN had 340 spare planes at Guam in July 1945 to support care operations. There were similar size reserves at Anwick, Laity, and Hawaii. That doesn't surprise me. Surely the UK should have got built a longer a lot of longer hulled Arc Royal Starships for Ford Aviation as a support ship. They would have loved that, but there's only so much they can get away with. Okay, right then. So, suggestions received already for patrons. <laughs> Put thirty six million right up there. Yeah, this was because I spent this afternoon working out which page, uh, where, why patron thirty six didn't cease to exist, but patron thirty seven did, and patron thirty eight did. And this, of course, is patron thirty six. As that fixed the uh, whole. So this is actually patrons thirty nine and forty. So I apologise. But these are suggestions already received. I will be dis putting, uh, making my decision on Saturday about which topics are going in, are going up. So that that will be arranged and set up to go live on Sunday for a vote, and then of course there'll be a week and. Then the vote will uh, the, uh, re uh, to get the results. So it'll be from Sunday to Sunday, brew ships to brew ships, and these are some of the suggestions already received. If you'd like to suggest other topics, please go to pay, uh, go down below. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. One, it was kind of a repair. It was kind of a sort of one which didn't really have a question, but was more a sort of discussion and general gallop through the history of. So. That's what I was trying to prepare it as. The ultimate thing is, you have ships appear when you I when you have one of two conditions. You either are going to be having to uh, repair ships appear and depot ships appear when you have two conditions. You either have lots of small ships which can't, don't have the facilities and the space to repair themselves, or in future terms, maybe don't have the crew to repair themselves. This is something coming up. The more and more we automate and uh, cruise and we reduce the crew numbers, the more and more a depot ship, which has maintenance facilities and maintenance personnel in them, becomes maybe a uh, maybe potentially sensible ship to have. But secondly, it's also when you're operating further away from home and you want to keep as much forward operating capability as possible. So I'll expand these so you can see some of the uh, some of the ideas being put forward. We do have our usual mix of um how do I put this? What ifs based on science fiction? And some very interesting history or historical ones. And we also have Andrinov's hypersonic missiles and a potential effects on the 21st century author, which is kind of a very modern one. But if you don't mind me doing it bilge pump style, which is historically infused, uh, using whatever I can think of as, pre uh, as predecessors for it, I'd be happy to do that one. Um, I might. Have to say, I, as always, I do reserve the right to slightly massage the questions before they actually go towards your vote. And that one, I might use the phrase, I might sort of use some using, uh, might insert using his uh, historically pertinent examples. Yeah. <laughs> 
Vision. River class could be upgraded to Corvettes. The line between them, uh, of heavily armed Corvettes and light frigates, is pretty blurred. Like that between heavily armed frigates and destroyers. This is why your bilge pumps are pushing for a rating system. Frank Spawner, are there any repair ships in the sci fi Star Wars? Um, hmm. Fairly sure the. I, I'm, I'm fairly sure the Rebellion must have some. Oh, I'm strange it's not the 60 odd escorts it had when I joined up. <sighs> we love that. Uh, honestly, 60 odd escorts would be really useful. At the moment, I'd settle for getting us up to 24 to start off with, and I'd really like us to be up to 36. In my. If I was getting my dream floated of the current constructions, I would be replacing the fight at the 45s with 12 Type 83s. I'd be having 12, at least 12 Type 26s, at least 12 Type 31s, and at least 12 Type 32s. And I'd be using the 31s and 32 as my presence slash patrol ships around the world. And I'd basically have the 83s and 26s grouped up into, I don't know, six escort groups, either centred round a carrier or centred round an amphib, an LHD, or acting as a surface action group or whatever, um, as my, fo uh, uh, as sort of core forces wandering around, waiting for our, basically being there, being present and being uh, sort of being the heavy fleet wandering around the world, that allies can slot into and go, yes, we're now part of a major task force because we've got a carrier here. We've got two of the world's best destroyers. We've got two brilliant anti-submarine ships. We've got supply ships, everything. But yeah, I do realize that is a bit of a pipe dream. Don't you? People don't need to comment and tell me that one. I'm not allowed to suggest something like taking Dan Freeman on a tour of museum museum ship of video diary, I might. That would probably not be a live. That would probably be a recorded video. And that is pretty much what I'm doing. As I said, I'm going tomorrow. My plan is I am recording uh, a video down at Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. I am doing some a video on M33 and doing some recording with her, which is always lovely. And then from uh, after that, I am taking my friends who are coming down to record me. I'm going to give them a tour of the dockyard because that's what I basically they asked for as a thank you for um, coming down and being my video crew, my, you know, my exact team. Uh, they're getting a tour of the dockyard so we can all feel sorry for them right now. So that's what I'm spending my uh, my Friday doing. And then I'm going to lunch, late, late lunch somewhere in Portsmouth. Uh, probably somewhere in Gunworth Keys, knowing me. And then after that, home. So it'll probably be a very late lunch, considering I doubt we'll start wandering or doing our dockyard tour till about 11.30ish. And it'll probably be about an hour for each ship on the tour. Miro's, well, props museum so four hours. So probably I end up will end up going for lunch roughly twelve thirty, one thirty, two thirty, three thirty. Probably about four o'clock ish. That's everyone. I'm still trying to work out what a British Empire Royal Navy would look like. Mm hmm. <laughs> Oh. My calm guys, I tend to think that until my SD's main reactor is not is breached, and whilst they're having a living crew, it can repair itself potentially. Frankfurt, did the USN know they were sinking ships of American prisoner walls on them? Nope. Otherwise, I'd probably try to board like, boarding. MC Legend Thirteen. Imagine if the Belfast got modernized and joined the Falklands War in eighty two, and fought the Belgrano. Well, that would have been quite cool. It would have been quite cool, but more importantly, she'd have probably been Michael Clapp's flagship. He would have probably had her sitting in uh, in um, 
En... Mm. You probably had her sitting there going... San in San Carlos Bay going, You want to come and take these, isl these islands back? Take the, uh, you want to stop us taking these islands back? Yeah. I got 12 six-inch guns. That'll remind you why not. That well, that one's not going to work. Thanks, Are the milk cows tenders? Um, I suppose to an extent. They're mainly fuel ships, though. They do carry some other supplies, but they're mainly fuel ships. I'm not sure that's true. That smaller crews means less hands available for damage control repairs than someone when someone starts poking holes in ships. True, but you can have automated systems to help that. It's mainly it's the repairs afterwards. And honestly, I'm starting to think about depot ships from the perspective of we've all seen US Navy destroyers going around the world and ships, they look worn out, they look tired. Mainly because their crews don't have the time to paint them and do all the things that they used to do to keep them spick and span. And it's almost a case of have a cr have a ship a depot crew maybe even man it like the same uh, uh, crew it with uh, or how do i put it G use the cbs as your model have i don't know uh, a professional I, I i don't you couldn't call them c they wouldn't be cbs because they wouldn't be construction battalions but they'd uh i don't know mbs i don't know what you call them but um well, that was maintenance battalions, uh, MBs. But basically, have them uh, have a ship set up with personal board who will do help you with the maintenance. Take care, John Shea. <laughs> oh. This squad. You can live stream from a mobile phone. Five hour time difference, man, and that makes any ship on the US or Canadian East Coast perfect viable ship to live stream for a Thursday evening live stream. Yes, but I'm in the UK. Although, if, you know, I am. Let's put it this way. My plan had been to save up money and try and get to Canada next year. That had been my plan. But now, of course, I'm buying a new car. So that's kind of made a dent. And it looks like I'm probably going to have to do more major work on my tower to get that working properly. Uh, that's the computer tower. So that's going to depend... It literally is going to depend on how well YouTube and Patreon do. Because if YouTube and Patreon take off and I end up with, I don't know, three times the number of subscribers I have now on both, then I can probably afford it, judging by the amounts of money coming out of the very kind, generous donations which come in. But, or maybe if I get, if my book really does sell really, really well, then I can afford it. Because that is something else I promised me. If the, yeah, I promised myself if the book does really well, then I'm visiting HMCS Hyder and I am visiting HMAS Vampire. I might be bringing them home with me. But, you know, I'm sure the Australian and Canadian governments will not object too much. Or if they do, they can try and catch me. Uh, Frank, I'd like to see what are the British uh, CBs? They're the mobile naval uh, naval basing units. Mabs. <laughs> oh. Nice, sir. Same three to three is the is the M twenty nine class monitor ship. Yes, 
That's what I'm going around tomorrow. Scott, in the UK, for minor logistical problems. Hiding Drax luggage, problem of Have you seen how little Drax packs? He's one he's an amazing packer. The, the, the man can survive on minimal. It's just you know, I thought I was good because I get mine all in one bag. It's one big bag, but it's one bag. He's just it's just amazing how much he gets in there. It's just, you know. Mm. How many iron brews does it cost to fly over Canada? A lot of iron brew. Don't know, 6831. Was CVN65 uh, Enterprise too small to be used as an email test picture? Mm, yes and no. Frank, sorry, uh, sorry Dr. C, C, your sound cut out on the CB question. I'm not sure why. Uh, but I basically, I said, and I, uh, the British have the Monabs, they are the British CB, a version of CBs, and um, the Mobile Naval Basing Units. Come on, just make sure no kangaroo assassins are hiding on the somewhere on the ship. This is where I'll, you know, I was asked earlier, when do the fluffy research assistants come in and help me research? That is when, don't worry. I will have... A poodle and a corgi to protect me from the kangaroo assassins. I have no doubt that the poodle will be able to jump as high as the kangaroo. And the corgi will probably wind up in one of their pouches going to sleep. <laughs> oh... <laughs> oh. <sighs> fun times fun times so as you can see what we've got coming up uh we have pearl harbor product of the kantai kesson doctrine or something to do for 7th of December. Um, I might modify that title a bit, but that's broadly speaking what I'm going for. Uh, then it's going to be the Robert class monitors on the 14th of December. 25th of December, there's going to be a long patrol out, which is uh, M29 class, including M33. So that's when the footage that's going to be taken tomorrow is going to come out. Hopefully after I've cleaned it up and made it look nice and pretty. Not decided on the long patrols for the rest of the month yet. 21st and 28th of December, still thinking about it. And I haven't decided on any lies for December, but that's mainly because I'm honestly gauging opinions. And one of the things I'm going to be doing wandering around on tomorrow is thinking about what the lives are going to be for the 2nd of December. Because that's only next week. Thank you, Bijan. So, yeah, 20... Uh, I've... Finished roughly 20 minutes, got to the end roughly 20 minutes before I expected to. So, any more questions? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, even that's good. Even better. No one will question the amount of luggage he's taking. It'll seem a perfectly normal amount with a large bag that only occasionally moves and screams that the creep Norway and Singapore were tactical and strategic disasters. Oh god. Honestly, the worst of them all is Norway. Because Norway precipitates the rest. If you still have control of Norway, or new Norway is benevolently neutral or even just neutral. Then the North Atlantic becomes so much easier. So much easier. Battle of Barrent Sea, Sharnold. Tempting. 
Calgasm, Marine on off airplanes. Uh, drones and M20 Q25 aerial fueling of an M30, F35 in September. Possible impl implications? Mm, could be interesting. Massive Grammar, what do you mean by CVN65 could and couldn't be used for email testing? It's big enough, but it would have cost a lot of money. That's what I mean. It's big enough, but it would have cost money. And we all know that the United States Congress doesn't like spending money on the Navy unless it has to. Unless they are dragged kicking and screaming, they don't want to spend it. And there again, that goes for pretty much every other government in the world. None of them like spending on defense at the moment unless they have to. Because it's money, if you spend money on defense, it's money you can't spend on social programs which make you more popular with the public. And you can understand that. It's, it makes sense. You know, you have other criteria which you're focusing on. Oh, I don't Let's see. Sorry, question is just coming in now. Ah, that was a couple of seconds of me to, uh, me typing to actually get the questions come because someone's commented, I think down below or something because it's just flashed up to me. It was flashing up at comments, 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 but I think they might have been the um, <clears throat> uh, the amorous people putting on their comments again. That's good. I heard that the F-35 that went down in the meds suffered an engine failure due to an ingested rain cover. Have you heard anything? That rumour has been wandering around, but I haven't heard it confirmed by any reliable source yet. So I'm that could be just a rumour that's just started. And it's just rumours like that can go around and take off because it sounds so funny and oh, we can make laugh. Um, it also sounds kind of strange to me. And it's very, it, it, it's going to sound strange, but those covers, they're quite careful them. They're very careful, and they're also bright red, so they're kind of visible. So there is... It's unlikely they would be left in before it started its flight, its testing, and it's moving, because they'd be taken out. And they check they take them out. So the other question is that one managed to get one... It managed to seep it into its engine from somewhere else. So they weren't... It wasn't stored properly? That, again, doesn't seem... Let's put it this way. It sounds funny and everyone gets to laugh about the stupid silly mistake and make fun of the various British things and it might be true I don't know it isn't but my instinct is always to question when things come out as a nice easy la ha ha solution
Zadrim, how much better would naval aviation have been for the fleet air arm if there had been a twin Pegasus engine like the twin Wasp without the fiddly sleeve valves? Uh, it would have been really quite useful. But there is a question as whether that would have worked or not. It, we, let's put it this way. It would depend how well it worked. If it still maintained the Pegasus's reliability, then it could have been really very, very useful. Malaga, hello. How much time does it take on average for you to prepare for one of these episodes? I usually spend most of a day preparing. I usually put about... Well, when I say most of a day, I usually spend about six hours preparing, six to seven hours preparing for a live in terms of pulling stuff together. But I've usually done a bit of research even beforehand. Uh, a long patrol, roughly the same. So it's usually been about... A couple of weeks of me looking at articles and reading stuff, and then roughly six hours pulling it together. It's not a quick process, but I, that's because I think you deserve a quality product, so I try my best to bring together a quality product. It doesn't always come off that way, but it is always aimed at being that way. Not, uh, not, uh, not, uh, not as an economy question, but what was money spent on before World War One, Two? If not defence, education, uh, various municipal programs, uh, some actual healthcare, etc., and some things limited ones. Uh, foreign policy, a lot of infrastructure, and a lot of administration. Administrating the empire wasn't cheap. What if Atreus Warspite survives to be a museum ship, but is reacted for What is the Argentine response? Crying. Let's be honest, if there's a 15-inch battleship surviving and reactivated for the Falklands, then A, you've got Michael Clapp sitting in HMS Warspite, which is not a good scenario for anyone other than Michael Clapp. B, you've got 15-inch guns somehow sitting down there in the San Carlos Bay, so there is no longer any Argentinian opposition on land because anything that does try and oppose is going to get 15-inch shells raining down on them. It's just, it's not nice. Vanguard or war spider around for the Falklands, it's not good. Let's see, carry on. How many 40 million Bofors AA guns and 20 million Oricon AA guns can be fitted to US as Wasp had she survived? A lot. A lot. Well, I wouldn't like to estimate. Dep it depends. Is this the gunnery officer of the HMS USS Enterprise get allowed to put more on her? Because if he's anywhere nearby, then that's going to be a lot more than what I'd estimate. Okay. Oh. Night MC Legend 13H, will you make a video of what if aircraft carriers were never invented? 
Um, if someone asked me to on Patreon, I certainly would. And otherwise, I might not, because it would be a very... It would be something to... If I was doing with my own project, it's something I could end up doing a long way, and it could get very boring. Whereas if someone else asked a question, it would be answering that question sort of thing. My second round, a two cent piece of duct tape destroyed a 70 million pound Boeing, um, 70 million dollar Boeing 757. Mm, yep. That's good. I had the same fe kind of feeling. It could happen, but it would seem to need a whole string of utter incompetence to allow it to happen. And in my experience, flight deck crews are not usually places where you get a lot of people who are going to do a lot of incompetent decisions. Frank, on, Dorsey, what is a very unique type of auxiliary ship that you surprised ever existed at all? Honestly, most make sense, but the Royal Navy at one point did look into making a shower tender ship. And I was sort of a case of, mm, just put showers on the ships. And which is what they ended up deciding doing. Let's be honest, a movie ship is, you know, that's not, and a brewery is, this is the Royal Navy going around the world. We're always surprised they don't have more breweries. We're always we are always surprised they don't have more breweries going around the world. Hmm. Can we at least see a picture of... I have put up a picture of Vulcan. I put up a picture of Vulcan earlier. Carl. Vulcan was sitting around here for a while. And as 3D printers roll in the near future? Well, that's the trouble. I haven't really touched 3D printers because... As you have heard on bilge pumps, that the debate is whether or not they're going to actually be fitted on the ships themselves. 
Thank you, Malaga. Saying I do quality presentations, that is the aim. Um, the, the, and this is the problem. Will a 3D printer need to be on a specialist ship, or will you put the 3D printer on your own warship? Will it go in a space like this? Or a vessel like this? What would you do? Because if you put them all in a special ship like this, you can carry bigger ones and you can achieve more efficiency in production. But that also creates a single point of failure. Whereas if you put them in lots of ships and lots of ships carry them, then they look after themselves. And so there's no longer a single point of failure. And you then ask, well, how big a parts am I going to need to 3D print? If I'm looking at an aircraft carrier and I'm 3D printing aircraft parts, why would I want them in a separate ship like that? I, I've got a massive ship already. I might as well put it on there. And that's far easier. I could have one of the lifts go down to an inter... I, I could have an internal lift or I could have an external lift which pops down. An external lift could pop down a level below. And there could be underneath the hangar deck, there could be a printer assembly center and the aircraft just roll out, print it up. Right? We have a printed aircraft. The, that's the real problem with 3D printers. It's kind of like when we talk about Star Trek logistics and we have replicators. And you're sat in Stargate. Well, in one of the episodes where they turn the beam systems for the, uh, the Asgard beaming technology into a replicator technology because they're stuck in time. But leave that to one side. The moment you start having these sort of things, you start thinking, well, do we need the big specialist ship when we can just replicate our supplies? And ultimately, if you do are able to 3D print stuff, then what you're ultimately your supply ship probably becomes more and more focused on is the things you can't necessarily 3D print. So you might be able to 3D print wing panels and pieces of airframe, etc. But you probably won't be able to 3D print something like an engine. Maybe a circuit board, maybe not, depending on the complexity of the circuit board. So your supply ship becomes about that. And then the thing is. Can you have a repair ship which can build a whole engine? Probably not. Well, you could, but how expensively, how often would you have to do that? And what's his viability of doing that versus having a land-based installation do it? it? It becomes a complicated scenario. So 3D printing doesn't necessarily work in the favor of a future repair ship. It is something which a repair ship might have, but it doesn't necessarily is something that future repair ships are going to be built around. Because 3D printing is something which could add to that facility on board ship as much as it could give this ship a useful boost. And if you do it this way, you have a lot more survivability. That's what. Could I 400 can of submersible seaplane tenders? Mm, not really. Take care. Night night, Bijon. This is Vulcan. And she is a. This one is HMS Belfast. And this is Vulcan. So this is one of the mechanical workshop inside HMS Belfast. This is a repair ship which the US Navy has had. Until 1991, from 19, she was laid down in 1939, launched in 1940, uh, and commissioned in 1941, and served 50 years. That's 600. Virgin Air 301 and Aeropod 603 actually did. Mm. Mm. 200. They are a long way from print, uh, from print, uh, from 3D printing titanium turbine blades. Yeah, which is why I say engines probably going to have to be carried. 
Jump from Earth. No more or less, no or less aviation, uh, aviation than more big ship battleships built and probably more Jutland style battles. Mm, I'm not so sure about that. A Jutland style battle happens in the scenario where you've got the high seas fleet versus the grand fleet. If you consider in the Mediterranean, there was never any reality of it being a Jutland style battle. Cert came closest, possibly, of them, but it was more a task group engagement as the different fleets go around. So I don't think you see a Jutland style battle, more maybe more Falklands, Dogger Bank. That green, read the free printers, both. I want a maintenance ship with large printers and small ones on warships. Mm. This got 3D printers on all ships for standard maintenance parts and small repairs. Specific 3D printing ship, possibly part of a floating dock, a dry dock for more substantial repairs. Maybe. But George Newman, mm-hmm. Pan Am went bankrupt after Long Beach crash, got sued for taking uh, for not taking security precautions that nobody else was taking either. Ah uh, yes. Trent Lanko. 3D printers will be on every naval vessel. The issue is training and what parts will be imprinted in each vessel for what roles. Mm-hmm. Comments. Oh, sorry. I thought of the uh, picture where the Vulcan's five-inch turret show, probably. I will grab that picture, then. I have that somewhere, but let me do my search on my system. Hang on. Work. Let's hope this works. He says hoping it works. May work, it may not. YouTube may like it, they may not. I might try and claim copyright on me. But no. There is Vulcan when she has her five inch guns fitted. And actually, I've got a better photo of her, I think. Yep. This is her when she has 5 inch guns, which do look pretty darn similar to a certain 4.5 inch gun. Various points she had camouflage as well. Right. It is 10 o'clock. And I did promise everyone I'll be finished and in by 10 o'clock tonight because I have to be up very early tomorrow morning. Because I'm going to Portsmouth, I said. So let's finish up the questions and check your wins. Okay. MC Legend 30. Does an eradicator class ship. Does it go? Eradicator class. I don't think they did, but if they did, it probably would have been a heavy cruiser. It's not really the right name for a capital ship. Abba, how specialized were the store ships? I, if explosives need to be kept cool or. They could become very specialized very quickly, depending on what they needed to be doing. Now, Prim, you'll need to be able to carry free spare 3D printer parts. Probably. Hmm. Oh, Richard, the USN got away from the depot ships because skilled trades crews were expendable, expensive to train and retain, and because they competed against civilian ship repair businesses. Oh, yes, they did, but mm, it would be nice to have them. 
Advert. Pym assumes a blacksmith has to at least ha start with a hammer, else... Mm, yeah. Hello, I was asking. No, that is not a very lot fat destroyer. That is a uh, supply ship, a support ship. Take AD, you 40. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg. Thank you, 96831. Thank you, Frank Spazato. Greg Sarsky, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. And thank you for watching. Fun. Fun. Thank you, everyone. I shall do this. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, George Newman. Thank you, Steve Winnish. Thank you, Dan Freeman for and da Dan Freeman and Stafford for and Sean for all your admining duties. Thank you, Sean V. Thank you, Calvin Gasberg for suggesting a topic. Thank you, Adfab. Thank you, Seneca Nero. Thank you, everyone. Zachary Gherkin. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Have a nice evening, and thank you for being here. And MC Legend 13H. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.